Boom. So, um, I know it's hard to believe because you've seen the afternoon and, like, the late morning. But believe it or not, Bulls actually started out having a really good day. <laughs> I'm sorry, but it's funny because he started out having a good day. I was like, oh man, he might be able to, to do something with this. So, um, and then his day got bad. Um, and then it got really bad. <laughs> and the thing is, is I'm guessing a lot of you forgot that his day started out well. And so the jury probably did too. Um, yeah. Um, and apparently they're wrapping it up like tomorrow with closing. So that'll be exciting. That'll be interesting. Um, all right. Now I'm going to do a really quick recap of the one issue that I end up having to explain every day. And it's not, I'm not like, that made it sound like I'm bitter. I'm not bitter about it. It's just we got to we got to explain it because somebody's gonna ask, and um, let's talk about it. So um, somebody says bring back the welding. That wasn't welding. That was fuse. That was fuse going off. All right. So um, one of the things that is a major issue in this trial is blanks versus dummies versus live ammunition. So live ammunition. Everyone knows what that is. It's you know, you put it in a gun, it goes bang, and out the front end comes somebody has a really bad day. Um, so, but on film sets, there's a couple of, you wouldn't ever, there's never any reason to have live ammunition on a film set for this kind of fictional movie. So, um, there's two other kinds of ammunition that you would see on a film set. And the first, and I didn't realize, I, I just remembered that I actually have some is this, which is blank ammunition. So blank ammunition doesn't actually shoot a projectile, but it does have a primer and it does have powder. So this is live in the sense of it will go bang, but it won't actually send a projectile out. This is dangerous. Um, it is dangerous if you put this in a gun and you were to point it at somebody at close range, it can injure them. So they have to be careful with this. But how can you recognize blank ammunition on a film set? Well, uh, this crimped end. Uh, the crimped end tells you this is blank ammunition and not, um, not live or dummies. Now, the other thing is dummy ammunition. Uh, dummy ammunition looks like real ammunition. It's designed to look like real ammunition. There may be visual indicators or there may not. Uh, in this case, this dummy ammunition, which I got from Movie Armaments Group, does have a visual indicator. It's got a punched out primer. There's no primer in it at all. Uh, there is also, you know, some of them will have a hole drilled in the side. Um, it may also have a, a BB in it, right? May also have a BB in it. And this is a good question, or a good point. There are 22 birdshot with crimped ends. So uh, crimped end doesn't necessarily mean blank, but... It, there shouldn't be 22 birdshot on a set either. All right. So um, that is important because there's going to be lots of discussion all the time about what kind of, you know, what kind of round there is on a film set. But let's, um, and this is a good uh, point, real versus replica versus rubber prop uh, versus prop gun. So a real gun is a gun, like just, a gun. Uh, now, prop gun has two different sorts of meanings that we see. Prop, as in anything on a movie, is a prop, but you'll also get armorers talking about prop guns as in replica guns, um, or as in, and this is where you get into all sorts of difficult, you know, circumstances there. Uh, replica, me meaning something that is like replicating an existing gun, but depending on who is using the language, because the language is getting real sloppy in terms of witnesses saying one thing or versus another, uh, but limit or it's a duplicate of a an existing firearm. Some people are using replica to mean something like, um, you know, these modern Pietas that are real guns that replicate an existing gun, 
whereas some of the witnesses are using replica to mean um, a gun that replicates an existing firearm but doesn't actually function. So that's fun. Uh, rubber guns are real easy because rubber guns are just, they're made of rubber. They don't they don't have any way to go bang. So the problem is, is we're getting different witnesses using different terms for some of these terms. And that's a problem when we're trying to explain all of this. All right. So let's dive into what we've got this morning because they start off with OSHA. Um, was it? Can I explain why the defense case was so short? Actually, this is a longer defense case than most. Because a lot of the time, the defense case in a criminal trial will simply be defense rests. Um, I, I've run lots of trials where it's literally the prosecution runs their case. And then I stand up and say, defense rest, like defense calls no evidence. And then we go to closing, right? That happens a lot. However... Um, in this case, they're calling some evidence, but I thought they might call more. Uh, they wanted to call a, um, what is it? They wanted to call a, like a, uh, an armor, but they couldn't get an armor in time. They actually ended up making an application to the court to say, can we have an armor even though we filed late? And the court said, no, you can't. Um, so they're not calling an armor. They may call Thel Reed. I don't know. They may call Hannah, although I doubt it, given that they said that they're going to wrap tomorrow, because if Hannah's going to testify, I would expect that to take at least all of tomorrow. Uh, and, you know, so I'm not sure who their, their next witness is, but, you know, they have actually called some witnesses. And, yeah. So, we're not going to start with the funniest guy, because I tend to go through things in order, because the order explains... Uh, you have to see the order in order to understand sort of what happens today. And um, so we're going to start with some guys who you probably forgot existed. And the first of those is a guy, Lorenzo Montoya. And he is, we're bringing him up right here. Let me actually show you him on the screen. Um, you'll like that better than just, you know, me telling you he exists. All right, we're going to do that. And here we go, Lorenzo Montoya. Hopefully you guys are going to be able to hear this guy too. Uh, right now there's no audio, so you're not hearing this because it hasn't cut in yet. Oh, wait. You were employed. It's because I had it muted. <laughs> Your Honor, the defense calls Lorenzo Montoya. Oh, yes, this is a good point. Um, I skipped over this because it, nothing really happened. Uh, there was a motion this morning for a directed verdict. That's why everything started so late. So what a directed verdict is, is that the defense says, hey, the prosecution didn't call enough evidence to prove things, and therefore, um, therefore these charges should be thrown out. And so um, that that was their argument, basically. Now, I actually thought that they might have an argument for this, uh, based on the evidence tampering. But the thing is, is that the standard for this is so very low. All you need in order to defeat a motion to dismiss is some evidence on all of the elements of the offense that a jury could use to convict if they believed it. Uh, that is really, really a low standard, right? It's not that the court says this is believable. It's not that the court says that there's good evidence. It's just that there's enough evidence to let the jury make the call. And so you can, um, as an example of one thing, you know, just from my own trial experience, right? I went and I ran, like the prosecution called their case. And at the close of their case, I said, okay. Um, and the timing on this is usually after the prosecution closes their case, but before you begin to present evidence, you make your, your motion. And so the judge actually said to me, he said, Mr. Runkle, do you want to make a, mo you know, a, like to uh, make a motion for essentially a directed verdict? It's not quite what we call it here, but uh, we call it a non-suit application. And I was like, oh, if the judge is asking me if I want a non-suit, I totally want to non-suit. 
So I said, yes, Your Honor, I, I am seeking to non-suit the crown or the prosecution, you know, the crown's, uh, we call them the crown as opposed to the prosecution here. Um, I, I do want to non-suit them. And so the judge said, that's great. Um, I'll just pull them down right now while I'm talking. Um, the judge said, okay, uh, I'm going to deny the non-suit application. So he invites me to make the application and then he denies it. And he says, notwithstanding the fact that the Crown's evidence is incredibly weak and incredibly shaky, there is some evidence on all points. And I was like, gotcha. <laughs> so, um, I, it, uh, that went over, that case was over pretty quickly. Um, that was a very strong hint that like, maybe you don't want to call, maybe I don't want to call any evidence and we just went to, I win. But it was, even though it was very clear that the judge was never going to convict on the evidence the prosecution had brought, um, he still had to deny my, my non-suit application. So, all right, let's bring these guys up and we will, um, we'll talk about Mr. Montoya and his evidence. Where is he? And we've got some new members. Thank you, Kayla. And Lizan. And Sue. Thank you, Rainman YYC, for the five gifted memberships. And Tess for the five gifted memberships. And Spaceman Spiff. Uh, excellent reference. All right, here we go. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of law that the testimony you've given this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. All right, thank you. Talk into the microphone. Yeah, it's up to the jury to decide because the jury is the dis Can is the trier of facts, explain right? To the jury, how you are employed. Morning. My name is Lorenzo Montoya, and I am a compliance officer with New Mexico OSHA. <laughs> Prepare to die. <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to. Um, that guy probably sounds like an absolute badass when he shows up on site, right? My name is Lorenzo Montoya. I am here to check compliance. <laughs> so. Yeah, I I just thought that was uh, I just thought that was pretty uh, entertaining. So he's from OSHA, and I was kind of surprised by this because the defense in their motions in limine had suggested that they wanted to call the OSHA evidence via some other expert, and what they what they ended up doing was they just called the OSHA guys to like read their report and so I was like oh okay you're just putting the OSHA stuff in so um basically what are the OSHA guys and there's two of them we'll we'll look briefly at each of them um we're we're not going to go in huge detail over these guys I will say I think these guys were helpful to the defense this is probably the best portion of a day the defense has had these two guys and so they get to, to say some really fun stuff here in this proceeding this guy goes through his background for quite a while so i'm going to skip over that but um let's talk about the uh the fine specifically we mean the chain of command um above hannah gutierrez um beginning um at the lowest level with sarah zachary and then Gabriel Pickle, and then um, Dave Halls. So did your findings um, then include any... So, so then your findings that you just spoke of, those didn't include Ms. Gutierrez, right? Uh, as an employee directly engaged in the work, she is mentioned in the report frequently. Uh, but in terms of who do we identify as a member of management and thus who do we consider responsible, um, she's not. She's just an employee. So this is all a little bit of a shell game here because um, when, he's, when he says like, you know, OSHA's job isn't to point the finger at employees. It's to identify management concerns. And so like they literally are never going to say you know, that it was Hannah's fault, they're going to identify whoever hired Hannah as the problem. So, yeah. Um, the Parker, I already said that they had a good day with this. So, 
Y'all can just shove off. <laughs> um, this is the best they did. And the problem, like the main problem with this is that they put these guys at the morning when they really ought to have put these guys at the evening for various reasons. They just have a, a difficult time. Okay. Um, and and once you, you do your report and issue the citation, does the employer, the production company, get an opportunity to contest that? They do. And did they contest that in this case? They did. Was a fine ever ultimately levied against the employer in this case? Uh, there was, yes. What was that fine? Um, they, they came to a settlement agreement with the department um, at $100,000 even. $100,000. Um, but you might be saying, um, why is it only a hundred thousand dollars, right? A hundred thousand dollars doesn't seem like a huge amount. Um, a hundred thousand dollars is like the statutory maximum. There are limits in the law. And here's the thing is that a lot of these laws get passed. Um, a lot of these laws have like a fixed dollar amount and they get passed at a particular time. And, um... Why were they allowed to settle? It sounds like they settled for the statutory maximum. And so when the other side is willing to give you literally the maximum you can get, um, that is a good reason to settle, right? Like, you, if you cannot possibly get any more than that, then you tend to settle. Um, you know, if I'm suing somebody and the maximum I could possibly imagine getting is a million dollars, and they say, we'll give you a million dollars, it's like, cool. That's awesome. Um, so, um, that, but these, lots of laws get set up such that there is a, like a maximum set in the law at some point. And then these laws rarely get updated. And so what happens is inflation starts eating these fines and making them smaller. And so, like $100,000 isn't a lot to a film production. <laughs> So, but yeah, that's kind of why we've got that. And in your experience... And that could have zoomed you into 10 photos. <laughs> credit to Meg D on, on the joke there, but uh, yeah, credit to Meg D there. And have you seen your, uh, have you seen the state of New Mexico levy such a high fine like that to an employer for workspace, workplace safety? Ever? I believe we have in the past. Um, is, is that... That was not the answer she was expecting because it's the maximum fine. What she should have just asked is, is, it, is that the maximum possible fine? Yes. So, yeah. An average, is that a usual fine amount that you see? For typical inspections, no. Is it higher or lower? Uh, this would be higher than normal. Now, this is also, a, like, this is a great answer for the defense. Um, it's a, gr like, it's a good answer for the defense, but it's also kind of misleading because this is one of those things that when I hear it, if I'm the prosecutor, I put a little check mark on it to maybe come back to because when they say, is this a typical, you know, fine amount? Well, keep in mind, the typical inspection isn't a death, right? The typical inspection is not... Um, is not a dead person. The typical inspection is like, you know, sir, uh, you don't have enough caution tape around your forklift. Or, you know, sir, your ladder is not like, um, somebody painted a ladder or something like that, right? Um, yeah, it... So most OSHA fines aren't going to be because there's a dead person. It's going to be because, like, you know... This this button is supposed to be painted yellow, and instead it's painted green, right? Um, yeah. In your report that you write, uh, once you're completed Sir, it, are there any other individuals who review and audit your work? There are. Who explain to the jury the levels of review and audit of your findings and conclusions in your report? Right. So the proofreading, final edits, and that sort of thing um, fall to first, initially, my supervisor. 
and then um, her supervisor, who is our program manager, and then from him it would pass up to our bureau chief, Bob Genoway, and as well as our legal team. Um, Spoiler alert on the bureau chief, by the way. Um, all right, so let we're going to skip ahead a little bit here because uh, this guy, like, as I said, he was, this guy was good for the defense because he is not interested in what Hannah did or didn't do. He's interested particularly in institutional things, which is always going to point to management. OSHA doesn't generally point the finger at individual employees. If you're on a job site and somebody picks up a screwdriver and sticks it in your neck, the OSHA is going to be there to be like, why did you like, why did you hire employees with such stabbable necks? So, yeah. Yeah, this guy is also good for Baldwin. Yeah, and this is it. He supports the defense argument that Hanno is prevented from doing the job properly. He, like, this is the best that they could, that, this is the best that defense does. And I thought that this was really good. This is the part where I'm like, all right, they might win this. I'm thinking Bulls might win this. They do a lot to, they do a lot to snipe this later in the day. So, um, a lot of this ends up getting... So like I see it, Mr. A lot of this ends up getting buried, right? So, but yeah. Uh, and somebody says, um, OHSB employee, not an OSHA employee. Okay. Um, yeah. Except Baldwin was management, sort of. Um, I don't think Baldwin's going to call this guy, but, you know, we'll see. Uh, this was helpful, at least. Yeah. In your report, did you conclude whether Hannah was provided with enough time to inventory and inspect dummy rounds and, dummy, and blinks. That was one of our conclusions, yes. What specifically did you conclude about that? May I look at the folder? <laughs> would it refresh your recollection to review your report? Yes, it would. Okay. Um, he doesn't remember. He needs to check. Do you have it in front of you or do you want me to hand you a copy? I do have a copy in front of me unless yours is uh, highlighted or more. Uh, page seven. So now he's reading his report okay. just so he can confirm. So what, what were your conclusions with respect to whether Ms. Gutierrez was provided enough time to inventory and inspect the dummy rounds from her employer? We came to the conclusion that she was not afforded time to conduct her duties to the best of her diligence. And who didn't give her enough time to do that? She had been uh, instructed by Gabrielle Pickle to focus on other tasks. And. And did Rust, did, your, did you determine whether Rust had any process to ensure that live rounds were not brought onto set? Uh, we determined that Rust did not have any specific processes or procedures to prevent that possibility. And the reason why Rust didn't have any specific processes or procedures for this is because it's the armorer's job, right? That is what the armor, the armorer is, is supposed to bring the stuff and is supposed to prevent that. So, um... I, I, yeah. Now, this is great for defense. I'm just sitting there as not a person on the jury, as a person, you know, there going, like, all right, um, that that's odd. But the defense is like this. If the jury acquits, it's largely going to be because of this guy and his boss. And why was it that that was not, that, that was on the employer, in your opinion, versus the armor? In that manner... The employer is asking an individual to perform multiple safety-related functions for them while also telling them that they're spending too much time engaging in those safety-related functions and need to devote more time to other duties. And on that matter, we determined that to be maybe a managerial decision. Okay. Um, and did you conclude um, whether Russ Management provided Yarmer, Ms. Gutierrez, with any um, authority on training? Uh, we concluded that um, she effectively had no authority to make any sort of training decisions. Now, this is interesting because we've previously heard from the armorer 
that in fact an armor can shut down production, right? So it's like this is this is weird. Uh, and it's not chipmunk mode, it's at 1.25. Come on. And in your investigation, was that failure to give the armor authority to determine uh, training, was that a violation of any rust safety procedures? It was. What was that a violation of? Safety bulletin number one. Um, one of the required items is that the armor determines when training is necessary and if retraining is necessary based on somebody maybe mishandling a firearm. Okay. And so this is really good for for the defense, right? Um, this, I think, is, again, the best that we've got for the defense so far. Um, now we're going to jump from here to the cross-examination because, yeah. Uh, I don't want to spend all day on these guys, even though they were a substantial portion of the morning. So now we got him going up. Thank you, Your Honor. Ready to go. Mr. Montoya, good morning. Good morning. I'd like to, I'd like to talk to you a little bit uh, at, before I, I get into any of the details, a little bit more about the inspection process that you typically conduct. Um, how long do you have to perform this inspection? Uh, OSHA has a limit of six months to the day um, to initiate and conclude an inspection. All right. So does that mean that in some instances you may not have all of the uh, evidence that is available from, for example, an investigating uh, law enforcement agency? Uh, correct. And in this case, uh, is it true that you did not have the sheriff's report at the time that you issued your your report? Yes, the sheriff's report was the following day or two, I believe. All right. So he's basically coming in. This is the start of his cross. He's saying, you don't have all the information, right? And that's... Um, it's a good point. Whether or not they manage to completely undo these guys, I don't think they do. But there are some points that I really liked about this cross where it's just like, oh, right, we're actually going to do a cross-examination in this trial? Fan-freaking-tastic. So just to be clear, none of the information that the that was included in the sheriff's investigative report made its way into your report and findings, correct? <laughs> correct. Only their initial uh, public release, um, press release. The press release. Only that. Okay. But not any of the actual investigative materials. No. All right. Um, are, is OHSB authorized under law to fine or penalize individual employees? No. Only employers, correct? Correct. And as a result of that, I believe you explained that your, your primary role of investigation is to look at what the employer did in terms of creating a, a potentially hazardous situation. Uh, what they could do to prevent it or what they did to create it, yes. Great, thank you. Um, so even if as part of your investigation uh, you found concerning conduct by an individual employee, you couldn't issue that person a fine, correct? Not individually, no. Great. Um, and, and, and this is not a criminal investigation that you're conducting, correct? Correct. All right. And so uh, you mentioned you did not review the Santa Fe Sheriff's Office report. Um, did you conduct a forensic download of any of the individual's phones involved in this incident? No. Um, did you review the over 100 behind-the-scenes videos that were produced by production outfitters? No, those were not available to us. All right. So he's basically pointing out, hey, there's some issues here. Um, so, yeah. Um, that, uh, you know, that is sort of a relevant issue there in terms of, like, how good is your report if you're missing stuff, right? So that's kind of the key thing there. All right, um, let's keep going here. Did you review any footage from the filming of the Rust movie? Only a small clip that was put into public media. It, and is, was that the clip, just kind of a few second clip of Mr. Baldwin manipulating the firearm, firearm out of his bandolier? Correct. So all of the other videos that were filmed as part of the movie, you did not look at any of those, correct? Correct. All right. Um, did you hire any sort of firearms expert to review the revolver or ammunition? We did not. All right. Uh, did you hire or consult with a, uh, a an expert? I also really liked how this this witness, and this is good for the defense. You know, this witness is, uh, you know, he's not dodging these questions, right? I like that he's not dodging these questions, and he's just like, yeah, no, that's that's true. We didn't do that. We don't do that. Um, so that you know that's appropriate. Um, I see this line of questioning is bunk. OSHA don't do that. That's what he's telling the jury. He's telling the jury that OSHA or OHSB in this case doesn't do that. 
And so that's something the jury can consider, right? Um, that's something that the jury can think about is they didn't do these things. In armor, like film armoring. Uh, no, we did not. All right. Um, did you review any of the fingerprint analysis from the FBI? Uh, no. Did you review any of the DNA analysis from the FBI? No. Uh, did you review any of the ballistic chemistry analysis from the FBI? No. Are you aware that Ms. Gutierrez worked in her role as an armorer for 10 of the 12 filming days? As far as we're aware, it was uh, only permitted eight okay. days as an armorer. So you would be surprised to hear that she actually was afforded 10 armorer days out of the 12 filming days? Uh, it would be news. Yes, okay, great. Um, are you aware that Ms. Pickle testified at trial that if Ms. Gutierrez had asked for more than those 10 days, she may have granted them if they were justified? I'm not aware that she testified that. All right. Um, are you aware that on the morning of October 21st, 2021, Ms. Gutierrez had approximately three hours of time in which she could have inspected ammunition or done a uh, safety check of the of the revolver involved in this incident? No. Um, are you? So he's not aware of this. He's not aware of that. He's not aware of the other. This is this is a decent cross. Whether or not the jury ultimately is like, eh, we we agree with this guy. It was all management's fault. Is going to be a question for the jury. I actually would have loved to, this is one of those moments where I'm just like I wish I could see um I wish I could see what's going on. This is a good question. How do you prepare a cross examination without knowing what will be indirect? You get the same evidence that the other side, well, I mean, you you prepare based on like who this guy is. They're going to have his report. They're going to have his his CV. They're going to have all of these, you know, details and so you prepare to undermine the gaps in his report you prepare prepare to attack his cv you prepare to um whatever i like that this guy doesn't seem to have any sort of skin in the game other than that it's ohsb which means that they're they're always interested in you know in that um they're always going to be interested in the um you know, in the management end of things. Aware that, that it's been testified here in the court that Ms. Zachary was Ms. Gutierrez's supervisor when she was performing props, but that the roles About were as well as they could. That, um, had, that Ms. Gutierrez provided instruction to Ms. Zachary with regard to the armor her duties. Um, yes, with some interplay in that they're not quite peers. Great. Um, and do you agree that Ms. Gutierrez and her role as armor contributed, contributed to some of the issues that you identified in your report? Um, I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Sure. Do you agree that Ms. Gutierrez and her role as armor contributed to some of the findings that you issued in your report? No, I'm not sure I could necessarily agree. Okay. Give me just a minute. If, if you were to return to page four of your report. Uh, on paragraph 13, okay. the last sentence, unless a round is removed from a storage box or firearm and inspected, it cannot be verified as a dummy round. Uh, is, do you believe that that is the function of an armorer to perform this inspection that you've indicated on this report? I believe that would be one of their many functions, yes. Right. So if she, uh, if she failed to do that, then would she have contributed in this regard? He doesn't want to. He doesn't want to like find responsibility for Hannah at all, right? You can see that the answer. This is. This is the first time you see him hesitate. This is the first time you see him go like, I don't want to answer this. He doesn't want to just answer this question. You can see this part where he's like, I know what the issue is, but I don't want to say it, and so this is where he gets you know sort of a little squiggly, a little uh little wormy. OSHA's opinion is that management has to enable the work to be done in the first place. So if she didn't do that, our question would be, why wasn't someone ensuring that she would do that? Uh, so if she does something wrong, it's still not her fault. It's somebody else's fault for not making sure she does it right. Okay. Okay. Um, this is where the jury might lose this guy. This is, you know, this is where the jury might be like, hmm. And the fact that they're getting him to start looking a little whatever is better for the prosecution. Uh, that said, I mean, on balance, these guys are the most helpful thing we've seen for the defense thus far. 
and thus we return back to management. Okay, sure. And that gets back to the whole fact that you're looking at the employer primarily as the as the basis of your investigation, correct? Correct. All right. Um, do you do you agree that if Ms. Gutierrez loaded live ammunition into a firearm and then passed it off as a cold gun, that would be a workplace hazard? Certainly. All right. Um, <laughs> okay, yep, that, yep. And then lastly, are you aware, uh, I, I believe you conducted an interview with Ms. Gutierrez, correct? Correct. And in that interview, she indicated to you that she asked two producers for additional training time, correct? You recall that? I don't recall that off the top of my head. Okay, all right, nothing further. For that little hypothetical that, that Mr. Lewis just said, if, so if um, Ms. Gutierrez had passed off a loaded gun as cold, would that be a workplace hazard? Um, what if uh, Rust had not allowed the armor sufficient time to inspect that gun um, and rushed her and instructed her specifically of what they, they wanted her to do? Whose fault would it be then? I think I need to rephrase my question. So, so if the reason why she needs to rephrase it is that that was like seven questions. Um, that was just one question. You can't ask seven questions in one. You can't roll a whole bunch of questions together. In, that, in what he, Mr. Lewis had stated, if uh, there was a gun passed off as cold, whose fault would it be, or whose, I guess, whose responsibility would it be to ensure that the armor had sufficient time and resources to make that gun safe? It's always the responsibility of management to supervise effectively and quality control effectively. Um, if an employee is conducting a um, safety related task, they pass it off as safe and supervision does nothing with that and they allow it to be implemented. Supervision's responsibility to double check that. This was actually a bad answer that she gets on redirect. Um, on redirect she gets, like this answer that she gets is, it's always the responsibility of management. Well, what are you gonna, how do you deal with this guy on clothes? You say, what does he say? He says it's always management's responsibility, even if it's not managed, like, even if it's somebody else. So, like, you need an armorer, and then you need, like, second armorer to check the first armorer's work, and then you need third armorer to check that person's work, and when does that end, right? Um, I think this is where this guy has some issues. And so the jury may well go, hey, uh, we love this guy, we think he's great. And certainly there are some people out there who are really, um, you know, really big on Hannah's side who are going, this guy is the greatest thing ever. And I, I think he's good for defense on the balance. But, you know, you got to have some, uh, you know, you got to be aware of some issues here, right? So that is, um, yeah. Um, all right. So next up, we will go and look at the next guy. That is, I've got him down as OSHA guy number two, but uh, we'll hear his name again. Yeah, I'm here for Rust Productions getting all of the fines, but criminal responsibility is a different kettle of fish. Yep. Uh, James Kupfer, I think he's good for defense, but I don't think I'd call him the best thing ever. I don't think I would call anything. The defense has done the best thing ever. Um, I I'm, think there might be a word missing there, or I might be misunderstanding. But yeah, it, this, I just don't get it here. Um, yeah, the armorer is an oversight position. The armorer is supposed to be who is double checking. If they're obviously not doing so, then management steps in. I mean, I can see saying management, you should have had a better armor. You guys get a fine because someone died. But the armor has to have some responsibility, and that's typically where criminal law steps in. You swear upon yep, we're gonna, penalty of law I think I've got it. You'll give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Have a seat talking to the microphone. Mr. Jeremy, can you please um, just tell the jury how you're employed? Can we get 
Oh, she didn't get the name. Um, can you please um, state and spell your name for the jury? Uh, Robert Genoa. They're apparently sneaking it in. R O B E R T G E N O W A Y. Mr. Genoa, how are you employed? I am the bureau chief for the Environment Department's Occupational Health and Safety Bureau, also known as New Mexico OSHA. And uh, what what do you do as the bureau chief? I oversee all of the uh, OSHA operations for the state, including overseeing our compliance and enforcement program. Are you, um, in the terms of hierarchy, is there anybody ahead above you? Not within the OSHA Bureau. Uh, I report to your division director, uh, who reports to our um, deputy cabinet secretary. And do you supervise, uh, we just heard from Mr. Montoya, do you supervise Mr. Montoya? Uh, not directly, um, but I am in the chain of command over Mr. Montoya. And, uh, how so we've already heard that this guy is like the top of the, like top of the, uh, the chain here. Oh, how did you, um, did you review Mr. Mon Montoya's report in this case? Yes, I did. And what is the, can you explain the process of how that uh, review happens once the report is, is finalized? What happens with it? Uh, well, I work with the, the inspector throughout the, the course of an investigation, once an investigation is assigned. Um, and once a draft report is produced by the inspector, then um, it will go through a level, various levels of management review. Uh, and for this type of a case, for a fatality investigation, um, I would yeah, I would normally review the entire case file, including um, a narrative report and in other portions of the case file to um, ensure that if we're issuing citations that uh, they meet with uh, certain requirements of legal sufficiency. Okay, so first problem with this guy as a witness, he could bore for his country. Um, that was a long, that was a long statement <laughs> there, right? That was a, there was a lot to that. Um, this guy, like, answer some questions, dude. So you reviewed the entire case file. What, what is in that case file? Uh, the case file will contain documentation obtained from an employer. Um, also may contain documentation from other sources, uh, medical investigator reports, um, any type of police reports that are available at the time, um, photographs, uh, audio recordings, interviews of employees and other witnesses. Uh, Keep in mind, they have, these two guys are both testifying about the same report, right? So they're both testifying about the same actual report. Um, so why do they have two guys testifying about the same report? Well, because they really want you to focus on this report. An inspection report and narrative. And, and when you review that and review the report, and in this case, did you review Mr. Montoya's report pertaining to the fatality at the Rust production site on October 21st, 2021? Yes. And did you concur with that report? Yes. Did you make any changes to that report? Uh, I'm sure that any report will go through you know, minor editorial changes. Somebody's got to get some Photoshop going for that. Content meets with legal sufficiency prior to issuance of a citation. So yes, I'm sure I, there were some minor changes that were made during the review process. And with respect to OSHA's role in this, what what exactly is it that that your bureau is investigating and looking for? Um, yeah, our primary purpose is to determine whether any violations of OSHA statute and regulations caused or contributed to uh, the accident that's being investigated. And ultimately, whose determination was it um, whether or not to cite breast productions with any violations? It was mine. What Buck stops with this guy. What types of standards do you hold them to? Um, well, we would, of course, look for violations of any OSHA standards that apply to the work site that's being inspected. Um, there are a whole range of standards that, that apply, um, but we also in addition to, to standards, most of which are, are uh, incorporated at the state level from federal OSHA standards. Um, but the act itself, our statute, our governing statute, also includes general language requiring employers to, to provide a safe workplace. Is there any OSHA standard specific to, to firearm safety on a movie set? No. Then, So the reason why there isn't a specific standard for firearm safety on a movie set is that the movie industry basically has some of its own standards for that. But also the armors typically um, the armors typically have their own standards that apply and are more strict than that because the armors don't want to let people get away with any sort of screwing around. Um, okay, we'll get through this guy fairly quickly here. I'm not going to cover everything on this guy, but I will cover some of it. Um, 
And then in this case, uh, Santa Fe Sheriff's Department hadn't provided your bureau with a copy of their report. Is that right? Apparently, yes. It's That's their job to make sure he's that she's report not was doing until after, you issued, after the report was issued. I believe that's correct, yes. So um, how does that, I guess, how can you, do you believe that the reviewing the Santa Fe Sheriff's report is necessary to come to the findings that your office came to? No. Why? Um, because we're looking at, um, at uh, an employer's responsibilities, specifically under the OSHA Act, which is separate from criminal law enforcement. Right. And what are the... This is not a good answer for defense, but they're getting it out, like... Why don't you look at this? Well, we don't care about the criminal aspects. We just look at the employer. That's it. Specific, um, are, you, are you looking for any violations of safety rules that the employer engaged in? Yes. So who is it that decided to issue the citation in this case? I did. And what was the amount of the, site, the fine that was levied against West Production? Um, the initial proposed penalty was 130 some thousand. I don't recall the, the exact amount, but it was 130 some thousand dollars. Okay. And how is that amount, how is that amount chosen? It's based on the uh, statutory maximum provided in, in OSHA, in the OSHA Act. So was Russ levied the statutory maxim, maximum fine provided in the, the OSHA Act for its violations of workplace safety? Yes. So that's what they wanted to say. Um, statutory maximum, right? They, they imposed the maximum possible penalty. Why? Because, well, somebody died. Um, and then I'm going to skip ahead to cross-examination because cross-examination gets weird. And I think that this guy falls apart a bit on cross because some of it is, is odd. No further questions. Mr. Timberway, good morning. Um, I suppose let's just cut to the chase here. You're not conducting a criminal investigation at OSHA, are you? No. So the things that you're looking for, for the purposes of your investigation, may not be the same things that law enforcement may be, may be looking for as part of their investigation, correct? I believe that to be the case. Great. Um, you said, I know you, you indicated you reviewed... Um... You'll notice here he's starting to, like, his language is starting to hedge. I believe that may be the case. Just say yes, dude. Like, yes, that's fine several interviews and documentation and uh, Mr. Montoya's report. Um, as part of that, did you form an opinion as to whether Ms. Gutierrez's actions as an armor contributed to the breakdowns that occurred on the Rust set? Um, no. Um, do you recall giving a, a recorded statement uh, during a pretrial interview in this case? So this is like, hey, um, you 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 know you believed Hannah had some responsibility, right? And he says, "I don't think I formed that opinion." Okay, cool. Now we're seeing how they bring receipts, and we're going to see a little bit more about this. Um, I don't recall being interviewed prior to trial. Um, you don't recall giving a Zoom interview in this case on February fifth, two thousand four. Now a smart witness at this point is starting to get nervous, right? But this guy's going, I don't recall this interview. I don't recall it all. Like, really, you forget talking to the prosecution? You just forgot that? Like, you for you forgot that you talked to the prosecution? I'm sorry, did you repeat the date? 2004. I I'm sorry, 2024. Yes, 2024. 2024. <laughs> 2024. No, I don't recall that. Okay. You, you have so he forgets talking to the prosecution at all? I'm I'm sensing some weaseling here. I'm sensing some weaseling. No recollection of participating in a uh, Zoom interview with the counsel for the state and Scott Elliott, an investigator for uh, Hannah Gutierrez. No. All right. Yeah. Now she's saying, "Hey, um, here's let me give you a tip here." Mr. Genoway, would, would it refresh your memory if I showed you a transcript of that uh, that interview? It might help. May I approach? The date of the interview, not I don't know if this will help you, but the date, the correct date of the interview is November seventh, twenty twenty three. 
<laughs> this is stuff you gotta you gotta have right, and I, you can't you can't let the witness weasel on the dates because you don't know them. You've got to know them. You got to have all of this stuff nailed down, and this is this is not good. But the thing is, is there are some things that they did right that the defense frequently did wrong that we're going to talk about. I don't recall ever doing an interview. Okay. He doesn't recall ever doing an interview. That's good. So now they're trying to refresh his memory with this. Certainly sounds like it sounds like uh, responses I would have provided, but I have to say honestly that I don't remember. Okay. Really, you have to say honestly that you don't remember it, or are you weaseling? Because <laughs> this feels weasely to me when he's like, "I don't remember ever talking to you guys." Uh. Like, I feel like this guy's being way too cutesy here. I'm going to point your attention to a particular part of this interview, and then I'm going to ask you some questions. My approach. I mean, maybe, but it might be also that, like, you would think you would remember about this trial that you're going to be testifying on and so forth. Yeah, it, it's probably not his only case, but you'd think you'd, you'd, think you'd take notes. You'd think you'd review your file before you get in to testify about this, right? Okay. So just read through here. And would you want me to start? To yourself. Oh, yes, sorry. To yourself. Thank you. Uh, the other thing that, uh, that they said here is, do you remember having a Zoom meeting with our investigator. And the reason why I'm calling that out as important is that that is the better practice. You you hire, a, you get an investigator, you get a, you know, somebody. Uh, and the reason why is because if this guy says this never happened, this is, you know, this is fictional, you guys are making up this whole interview, well, then you can call that investigator without having to, like, call one of your lawyers. Whereas the defense is like, do you guys remember that conversation you had with us personally? And then what do you do if the guy says, I never had a conversation with you? Then it's, you know, then you've got to be like, um, I guess we're witnesses now. So uh, worst case scenario, if they did want to go after this guy, they could call that investigator to be like, hey, um, this guy did say those things. I'll start you here. But they actually are bringing receipts instead of just like, you know, just telling him. Okay. So now that you've read your own fool words, sir. Let us ask you again. Mr. General, do you agree with me that during uh, this they would have recorded you, it? You yes. agreed that Ms. Gutierrez, her actions contributed to the breakdown that occurred on the set? Yes. All right. So you agree now that Ms. Gutierrez has some responsibility. Um, and they got him to, to say, yeah, I, I did say that. I'm going to ask you a couple questions about um, the, the investigatory materials that you reviewed. Um, you you already indicated you do not have a copy of the uh, Santa Fe Sheriff's Office report, correct? I'm not sure whether we obtained one after issuing our citations. And, and to be clear, I'm talking about as you as OS or OHSB conducted its investigation and issued its findings, you did not have the benefit of the Santa Fe Sheriff's Office investigatory report to assist you with that, correct? Correct. All right. And did you um, did you have the benefit of reviewing any 
uh, behind the scenes videos that were filmed on the set of Rust? Not that I can recall. Do you recall? So they didn't see any of the stuff that we saw with the, like, the stunt guys pointing the shotguns around, you know, any of that. They didn't see any of that stuff. Paul, if you reviewed any footage from the filming of the Rust movie cameras. No. Um, did you uh, engage the assistance of any expert armorers uh, for your purposes of your investigation? Uh, we didn't. We didn't engage a contract. We had some brief discussions with potential experts, but we never actually engaged those experts. You never, so you never relied on any of their opinions to form, to inform your investigation. No. Okay. So we um, never talked to an armor. I know that you were asked some questions about um, determining fines against employers. Is it fair to say that OSHA's purview is not to assess fines uh, against individual employees? That's correct. So is it is it also fair to say then that even if you found that there had been some uh, concerning conduct by an employee, you wouldn't have fined that employee, correct? Correct. So now it's getting going to get a little bit repetitive here in the sense that they're just going to keep saying, you you look at the company, right? Um, these guys did well for the defense. This was the defense did well calling these guys. Um, I have criticisms of their testimony. I have some commentary. I think that the prosecution did as well as they could uh, cross examining them. But on balance, I think these guys are. A strength for the defense and if the if hannah is ultimately acquitted these two are probably the reason um but you know prosecution is saying like listen these guys are always going to say it's just the employer and you guys didn't really investigate much at all so that's him and at this point i'm thinking prosecution's having a really good day i was sitting there thinking prosecution is having an excellent day today they are really or sorry not the prosecution the defense is having a really good day today they're kicking some butt they're taking some names and um good for them defense is coming out swinging and this is also where the engine in this particular car starts to blow up because we get to scott elliott um who is and we're skipping past the rest of this guy so we get this guy and his sort of walk on scene here. I like his tie. I have one just like it that I minorly stole from Rob. So. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of law that the testimony you'll give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. All right, have a seat. Talk into the microphone. Good morning, sir. You... So this guy is here to tell us just how much this investigation sucked. And this is something you're often going to do as defense, is you're going to go and you're going to point out all of the flaws with defense, uh, with the investigation. And there's... Um, you got to be careful with this because there's always going to be a feel that you are, um, that you're sort of the Saturday morning quarterback, right? That you're sitting there going, because there's always mistakes. There's always things you could do better on an investigation. And there's always times where it's like, why didn't you do this? And so you have to be really careful about things where it's like, hey, um, you know, you ask, like you ask the officer, like, why didn't you take DNA? And they're like, well, um, 17 people saw your guy commit the murder, so we didn't take any DNA because we knew, right? This guy starts out starts out good, and he could have been a really excellent witness if he didn't go too far. That's This is the main problem, is that this guy goes... Um, this guy goes too far. He goes and... It's a problem that he does so. We'll we'll talk about like just why this is um, why this is an issue because he ends up he's too helpful to the defense in ways that get him. Uh, I think I think this guy got slaughtered at cross. Um, I think he did not do well on cross at all.
Please state your name again for the jury. Scott Elliott. Mr. Elliott, what do you do for a living currently? I'm currently a private investigator. And Mr. Elliott, prior to becoming a private investigator, did you have a career in law enforcement? Yes, I did. Can you tell the jury uh, what your career was in law enforcement, how many years? Uh, military and civilian or just? Uh, let's just start with civilian and we'll work back. Okay. Um, I was hired by the Albuquerque Police Department and I attended the academy starting in February of 1993. I retired in 2011. Uh, during that time period, I started out field services, normal uniform patrol. Uh, I went to the gang unit. Um, then I became a violent crimes detective in about 1995-96. And in 1998, I became a homicide detective. And I was a homicide detective when I retired in 2011. Why am I playing this? Because he's actually got a pretty good resume. This is a good resume, right? Um, he's got a lot of time as a police force, doing investigations, so forth. And then he goes into... Um, he goes into in becoming a private investigator. So, so you, you spent approximately, it sounds like, 13 years in the homicide division? Part of that was interrupted by post-9-11 deployment, but yes. At post-9-11, did you deploy overseas? I did. And, and was that part of your, and we'll get into your military, part of your military duties? Yes, it was. Okay. So how many, as part of your homicide uh, uh, portion of your APD employment, approximately how many investigations do you think you worked on uh, in homicide? As a case agent, 35 or 40, um, assisting on homicides, 150, 200. And, and this is just homicides. You, you probably had 150, 200. In terms of violent uh, crime or other types of narcotics or any types of, how many investigations do you think you've handled in the course of your police career? Do you even have an estimate? I don't think so. Um, I became detective in 1995, uh, hundreds of cases a year. And then by the time I was in violent crimes, it was slightly reduced, but um, that was all violent crime short of homicide. So lots of those. And, and you also said... So violent crime short of homicide. Um, keep in mind, you might be saying, well, short of homicide, is that like bar fights? Um, that's going to include things like attempted murders. That's going to include things like dude gets his arm chopped off. That's going to include all sorts of things. I'm seeing him big and... I i got to try to embiggen in a way that doesn't... Uh... All right, let's try this. Um... There we go. Hopefully, there we go. Is that a little bigger? About your military service, can you tell the jury briefly about whether you had um, uh, law enforcement type experience with the military? Yes, I was, I was commissioned in 1981 in the infantry. I spent approximately 10 years uh, on active duty. Um, Various, various duties uh, as part of the active duty time. And then in, I left the service in active duty in 1992, 1993, started with the police department. Uh, then I transferred into the reserves. Um, in Albuquerque, there was not an infantry unit anywhere nearby. So I did, was an engineer officer for a little while, and then I became a secondary specialty of military placement. And I worked in those functions until I transferred from the Army in 2003 to the Air Force. Uh, when I transferred to the Air Force, I took command of what's called a Heavy Weapons Squadron, which is a security forces unit, which is Air Force Police. Um, the difference with that unit is that they had weapon systems that are normally found in the Army. Um, mortars, snipers, uh, grenade launchers, things like that. So my prior Army career folded right into that unit and its mission. So, sir, you've, you've conducted investigations, both civilian and military environments. Is that is that correct? Yes, that's true. Okay, and Your Honor, at this time, I tender Mr. Elliott as an expert in quality of investigations, law enforcement investigations. So what he's being offered is an expert in, did other people screw up? Are other people, you know, did, is this investigation a good investigation or a, a bad investigation? So um, I can tell you some police officers hate these guys. Um, not all of them. Some police officers hate cops that go into this work where they're like, you know, hey, here's all the things you screwed up. As a former cop, here's all the things you screwed up. Um, not all of them, but some of them. <laughs> and I've heard some, uh, I've heard some cops have some comments on that one. Um, show me a perfect investigation before I die. You will never see a perfect investigation. There's always, there's always something else you can do. There's always something, you know, another one more step, one more test you could have run, right? Um, one more thing you could have uh, done. So, 
Uh, just trying to see here. Province of T, thanks for the membership. Uh, MindyFS, so glad you're covering this. A dummy is any firearms expert that points a gun at a judge. We're going to get to that. We are going to get to that in a big way. All right, let's... I'm sorry, what was... Did you the first thing you said, Mr. Johnson? Oh, sure, the quality of law enforcement investigations. No objection. I'm going to pull up some of the super chats as we go here, just or some of the, some Shirley, of the ones without uh, can questions. Can you tell the jury specifically, what did you uh, do in this particular case? Just an overview scope. Well, I reviewed all the discovery, um, all the reports, videos, uh, any documentation, any evidence uh, that included going and physically looking at the evidence in this case. In addition to that, I interviewed uh, the majority of the state's witnesses in what's called pretrial interviews. Um, I think the only ones I didn't interview were the FBI employees. Do you recall ballpark how many uh, interviews you conducted in this case, just an approximate? Hmm. 35, 40 maybe. And in terms of the reports, uh, did you review voluminous reports in this case as well? Yes, I did. And have you, as an expert, um, also made some conclusions based on your review of the materials, your interviews, and what you've seen in this case? I did. Okay. I, I don't want to hit every uh, point that you might make, but I want to hit some of the major ones. First of all, at the scene, um, at the initial scene when law enforcement responds, can you tell the jury, do you have any conclusions um, about the quality of the investigation by the sheriffs at the scene? Yeah, some of that was reached by my own observations and some of it through interviews of the deputies on the scene. Um, I felt like their response was probably not what it should be. Um, probably not what it should were, be. Yes, there were hundreds of people on that know. ranch. But if you narrow it down to who was in the church at the time of the shooting and who may have had involvement with the case, for example, the people that were just outside, uh, there was really about 20 people. Um, the first responding deputies, their job is first preservation of life, and then it is preservation of evidence and identifying witnesses and possible suspects. Um, in this case, uh, it was known very quickly who the shooter was, but it wasn't known who the witnesses were. And those witnesses, once they were identified, um, they should have been segregated so they couldn't talk among themselves. Now, let me stop you right there. When you now, let's let's comment on this because this is you know this is the defense. Uh, this is the defense position, right? Um, okay, you know, devil's advocate here. Like, we segregate everybody. How many cops did they have? They didn't have 20 cops, and there's 20 people. And keep in mind, at this point, nobody is detained. They don't actually have the authority to tell any of these people what they, where they can and can't go. So it might be good to segregate these people, but how do you... How do you keep... 20 people apart from each other with like three cops like okay cool um what are you gonna do right um so i mean it might be ideal but i'm sure they wish they had like 50 cops to keep everybody away and so forth um but yeah uh carson missing my niece who died way too young makes my anger at hannah much stronger i mean I'm really sorry for your niece. I'm sorry that you're missing her, but I mean, that shouldn't really play into our decision about Hannah here. Um, you know, and like, I don't see that this is possible, but this isn't the, um, you know, this is like where the officers are going to be like, what, what do you expect us to do? But this isn't at this point, the place where he starts to make himself vulnerable on cross because he is going to make himself vulnerable and the cross is going to come in hard on this guy. Initially, as a law enforcement homicide detective or somebody going on scene, you yeah. identify the shooter. What, what, in your opinion, is one of the first things that you should do? Well, the first thing you do is put someone with that individual, uh, segregate them from everyone else. Uh, you also want to, those individuals, since you are preserving evidence, you also want to secure their cell phones. Now, in this now keep in mind, um, Baldwin at this point isn't really a suspect. Like, nobody, like, at this point, they don't think Baldwin is, act, like, they didn't think Baldwin had criminal responsibility at this point. I think that they really came after him later when he started making statements. Um, but, like, okay, sure. You don't want Baldwin running around making statements. Cool. Um, how do you seize their cell phones? Because at this point, no, none of these people, like, they don't have a warrant for any of this. And it's like, if you 
a police officer can't just take your phone because they want it. They can't even take your phone because they think it's got evidence on it. Like, I could be sitting there and I could be like, I have literally filmed the crime on this, you know, on my phone here, and they probably can't take my phone because it's my phone. Get a warrant. And, like, you can't just go in and be like, phone's in the bag, everybody. Um, you know who can be like, phone's in the bag, everybody? A robber. <laughs> like, if you've seen uh, Pulp Fiction, where they go into the, uh, you know, where they go into the little, uh, you know, diner and they're like, everybody, wallet's in the bag. That's criminal. <laughs> like, you can't just take everyone's phone just because you might want it later. Um, you can ask for their phones and I would be like, hmm, um, about that, go to hell, right? It's my phone. Yeah. Based on the materials you reviewed, did it appear to you that Mr. Baldwin was segregated? Not at all. And um, along hey, with Kurt, the conclusion you, you just doing? stated, did it appear that his cell phone was taken from him? No, it was not. Uh, Mr. Elliott, did it appear to you uh, that at any time at the scene that day, Mr. Baldwin was segregated? He was not. Okay. Next, you talked about um, identifying key witnesses and, and uh, preserving evidence. Can you explain that a little more? Yes. Um, Sure, it's a crime scene. That doesn't well, mean you the, can the just take people's phones, don't though. don't have a scene of that small of, of an environment. Uh, Let's talk about your phone. Let's talk about why they can't just take a phone because they want to. Um, your phone has an incredible amount of personal information on it. And, like, um, in my case, my phone not only has uh, personal information, it also has privileged information. Um, so... Like, this would include information not just about me. It would include information about, like, my wife. My wife and I text. Um, you know, my family, who I text. Um, lots of people in LawTube. Um, various clients. You can't just take the phone. Um, but the other thing is that your phone is actually a point of personal vulnerability. Because... If I have your phone, I could probably, if I have your phone and it's unlocked, I could probably, like, I could probably start cleaning out your bank account if I wanted to um, by end of day, just by milking information off of people. Like, so, and this is a critical point. When you don't have a warrant for something like a cell phone and you take that anyways or anything without a warrant, that is how cases against actual criminals get tossed. Let's imagine a hypothetical. Let's imagine that they walk up to... Uh, let's imagine that they walk up to Baldwin. It's just after the shooting. The police have walked up. Baldwin is on his phone talking to, you know, whoever. I forget his wife's name, right? And they just yoink the phone out of, away from his ear. And then they're like, cool. Um, this is our phone now. And they go digging through this phone. And they find that he sent a text message... And that text message says something egregious. Like, let's say that text message, and this is a hypothetical. I'm not saying it would have. I'm saying hypothetically. Let's say that text message says something like, hey, I managed to swap in the live bullets with no one noticing, and, you know, she's dead. Right? That would be great evidence for the prosecution in what I would expect would be then a murder trial. And it would really suck when they lose that murder trial because it's like, well, did you have a warrant for his phone? No, you just took the phone in violation of his rights? Cool. Um, you can't use that. Can you, like... This is why they don't just steal phones from people because it's a great way to lose cases. You gotta do things right. You gotta do it properly. You can't just... And so in this guy's perfect world, they go in and they steal every phone and they lock everybody into like a, a private set, you know, soundproof box that they can't get out of. Um, but they don't have the authority to do any of those things. They, so, yeah. It was known immediately that the shooting occurred inside that church structure and that it probably involved uh, a couple of people just outside doing that, that uh, weapons cart. Um, so that was the immediate concern, that area there. And the deputies um, 
Thank you, Rain Man. Early responding deputies did get a pretty good list of who was in the church. And, and thank you, Jamie. The but those individuals were not segregated from everybody else. Um, they were able to mingle with people who were not on scene, who were in a different part of the ranch. Um, conversations were taking place. People were talking. So, like, how do you stop this? Like, you don't have any authority to detain them. And in fact, not only that, he's saying that they should have segregated everybody. But the next thing he's going to say is that they also shouldn't have segregated Hannah. It makes no sense. Working on cell phones. Um, and it's really unknown who they were talking to. And what is the danger um, or what is the concern on the part of an investigator? Thank you, Zoe. Suspects or witnesses are talking. Well, a couple things. One, people <laughs> could be getting their story straight. The other is I'll run. I love causes that. witnesses to misremember what they did and what they saw. Because uh, in my experience, good, honest citizens try to help. And they'll tell you something that their neighbor told them as if it was there, something that they saw. Uh, this is true, and it's not actually intentional. It's that memory is a reconstructive process. And so what you'll... They, and p psychology researchers have done all sorts of experiments on this. Um where what they do is they, um, they'll they do, like, tests. They get a group of people, they sit them in the room, and um, what is it? Um, they'll, they'll have, like, somebody burst in and, like, pretend to be doing something. Sometimes they'll burst in and they'll... Um, um, they'll pretend to be, like, um, you know, stealing the researcher's you know, computer or something, right? So that they've got somebody who's sitting there and, you know, this guy bursts in, grabs the laptop and runs out. And then they'll be like, hey, write down everything you remember. But if they have a plant in that room who says, you know, did you see that guy with the red hat steal the laptop? Suddenly everybody writes down um, that they saw a red hat, that the guy had a red hat and the guy had no hat. Right. Everybody. And the thing is, is those people aren't being deceptive. They're not lying. It's that they they now remember the red hat because that guy like the plant, the guy who was messing with it, said, you remember the red hat. Right. And so um, there's other things that happen. One of the really fun ones is um, lineups. So let's say you see a murder. Right. And you see a, um, you know, you, you, what you witness a murder and I show you a lineup that is a bad lineup. And that very much suggests one person. Like, let's say you, the, you say that the murderer was a white guy and I show you a lineup that has like, you know, 11 black guys and one white guy. You're going to pick out the white guy because he's the only person who matches or vice versa. Right. And you pick out the one guy who is closest. But then I go, oh, that was a bad lineup. And I show you another lineup. And this time it's 12 white guys who are all close. You'll pick out the same guy that you picked out last time. Even if that guy is not actually the dude that you saw. And we've, we've done this over and over in, in like experiments and so forth. You can contaminate memories. This is the, um, you know, this is what he's talking about here. And it's a legitimate com concern, but you can't actually go and you can't lock up the witnesses. And it is just human nature that if, if you talk about something over and over and over again, eventually the parts of it that you think that you did and it was what someone else did. So you want to clean, even if it's very brief and they didn't see very much or they didn't hear very much, you want a clean uh, statement of, of what their knowledge is. Okay, um, and with regard to uh, whether, if that is not done, um, what can that lead to? What is your conclusion about what can happen if people are not segregated and they're allowed to talk to people? Well, one, you can um, delete things off your phone. You can delete photos. Uh, it wasn't known at the time that somebody was videotaping what was going on inside on their phone. That's now, keep in mind, they did a full forensic download of the phones they were interested in. So... Um, you know what happens if you delete a photo at this stage? It's going to come up. They're going to find it as a deleted photo. 
this guy should know this. And the fact that he's not telling us this is one of these signs. Like, this is the point where I'm starting to go like, my dude. Mm. Because we're starting to have him go from, uh, he's starting to make this transition from Monday morning quarterback on to deceptive. Like, I don't think this guy is being honest here. I think he is trying to be misleading, and this is where he's trying to make this. This is where he's he's going here. Um, Possible. Um, almost every case you work now, someone has videotaped it with their phone. Did you also determine, and, and this is a, another point of it, that someone had left the scene and, and whether that person had been identified? As far as I know, they still have not been identified. Uh, now, I went, holy shit, when they said this. Did you, were, when you guys were watching, did you go, Holy shit, there's a mystery person? Um, there's a mystery person that nobody knows who they are? There shouldn't be mystery people on a film set. Because I can tell you that if I walk onto a film set and like I'm just like, Hey, I just want to hang out with the people filming Rust. Um, security is going to, like, you know, they're going to hit me with something and throw me out. Like, let's watch this again. The, another point that, that someone had left the scene and, and whether that person had been identified? As far as I know, they still have not been identified. Okay. Um, Mystery person, right? And I'm going, how the hell do you... I, I was like, wow. Um... There shouldn't be a mystery person on a set. Every person on the set should be on payroll and have like a badge and be known to everyone else. So I'm like, what? Where? And like, I'm sitting there going, Are, is the defense seriously running a gunman on the grassy knoll defense here? Like there's a second shooter? Like, <laughs> what? So, okay, um, cool, 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 cool. Um, all right, let's move on to some other things that he says here that I'm just like, mm, okay. Um, I've got my timestamp and it's like 30 seconds later, so we're just going to run through. With regard to securing the prop card on that scene, what is your opinion as to whether that was appropriately handled? No, it should have remained in place. Um, there was a individual uh, Brian um, was told to told to go get the cart he went out of sight behind the church on the other side of the church and then he moved the cart around towards the lieutenant's uh, marked unit that should not have been done this comment makes sense right this and he's got some comments that really make sense and he could have been a really good witness here he could have been an excellent witness if not for the fact that he goes way too far I don't want an expert who agrees with me so thoroughly that it's, you know, that they end up losing credibility. And that's the problem this guy has. As well, what is your opinion as to uh, the, or do you have any concerns about how the evidence on top of the prop card was handled? Well, Lieutenant Benavides um, took possession of the firearm with an ungloved hand, and he grabbed it right around the cylinder. So the largest portion of the revolver is how he picked up the revolver, put it into his vehicle at another occasion, pulled it out of his vehicle and put it back on the cart. He did the same thing with the ammo boxes from the uh, cart. So you definitely can't preserve evidence by touching things with your bare hands, but it also could have damaged anything that was on the, the boxes or the firearm prior to him handling it. So we're not going to get good fingerprints off this gun. We may never learn who was holding the gun that was used to shoot... Ho oh, right, it was Alec Baldwin, because this was seen by, like, 40 people. <laughs> right? Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Now, working our way through this, um, if... Uh, and you may be aware that there was evidence that were rounds thrown away um, in the course of your investigation. Um, what is the... Do you have any concerns at this point with how the police responded to that? The sheriff's responded to that matter. Well, it's my understanding that they were notified quite late. I think it was a month later. Um, but I didn't see any attempt to go out and see if 
They were still in the trash at the ranch. And, and there was no effort to see if they went out to see if those things were still in the trash at the ranch. 30 days later, on a film set where filming has been struck, they didn't go look for that trash can a month later after like after that set has been struck and everyone's left um like no shit they didn't like i threw out something i wanted to have a month ago and i haven't gone and looked in the trash for it because i know it ain't there <laughs> like okay dude i i get that like maybe you sh say hey they should have preserved the trash can at the time but like 30 days later saying that they didn't go back is like okay um all right is that something in in your normal investigation when you were doing homicide investigation you want to collect all of the potential evidence well in this case uh, there's a couple things the law enforcement was told very almost immediately this was the firearm used but the projectile can't be matched to a firearm and I know there were at least three 45 long Colt revolvers on that cart that day. So although the casing has been tested to match the firearm that was presented to law enforcement, there's no way to know that projectile positively came from that firearm. Really, dude? Really? Like, this is, this is bullshit. This, like, there's no way to, to know that projectile came from... Um, Joel Souza saw, like saw himself get shot um everybody in the room knows which gun was used that gun was distinctive from the other two because it was alec baldwin's gun and they made it they gave alec baldwin a gun that was different from the other ones like everyone knows this is the gun why are you saying that there's no way to match it because this was never in any any doubt unless we've got this theory where like some mystery person comes on the set and while they're doing it, the guy like leans through the church window and shoots Helena and Joel from the angle of Alec Baldwin in order to like stage a murder. Like what? What? Um, this guy had some good points about the investigation having problems but now he's getting into like ridiculously stupid things that are just not honest. He's so desperate to find any problem that he's latching on to imaginary problems. Like this is not a real problem um, at all. And he's going to get into some more not a real problems. So, you know. That live round. Any other concerns on the follow-up with regard to identifying the source of that live round or live rounds that appeared on set. That didn't seem to be followed up on uh, very strongly. Um, it, it's, it's a little confusing when rounds came onto the set or the scene, the, the ranch, and who brought them. It seemed that there were a number of times that, at least one occasion, I thought it was more that Sarah went to PDQ in Albuquerque and brought ammo back. Uh, there was the initial ammo provided by PDQ and then there was some ammo provided by uh, Ms. Gutierrez. And did you identify any other investigative steps that you think uh, should have been taken to try to um, further look into the source of the live rounds? Well, there's a lot of talk about the white boxes with the JS. Uh, that individual has never been interviewed, the producer of the ammunition. Um, so there really was no backtracking of where the ammo came from. You can't. They didn't interview Joe Swanson. <laughs> like, okay, you're going to go to like a guy who just like. Okay. Um, okay. I'm just like, hmm, we're reaching for everything, aren't we? Um, so. At, at this point, I'm just like. All right, this guy I have some serious doubts about, and I mean, this guy is well into this. <laughs> like, 
Like, and so what happens on cross? Well, um, unfortunately, this for this guy, the uh, the prosecutor is not sleeping because the prosecutor has some thoughts about this guy and she's going to tell us them. Full investigation of Mr. Kenny. Yeah. yeah, and this is a good point. If he wanted him interviewed, why didn't he interview him? Mr. Investigator. <laughs> yeah. Yes, especially considering that Sarah Zachary worked for him. Did you also have any concerns about uh, the failure? Oh, wait. We're still in the middle of his uh, direct here. I'm just trying to take us to the cross. We haven't hit on this. I'm just going to put this at one time speed. We're going to watch her walk up. Watch her walk up. Cross exam. This is the, and then there's this, <laughs> this, you know, this a-hole. That's what this walk-up is. That's what this is. And yes, we're going to get to gun guy, but I'm hoping we're two hours in so I can uh, get to the swearing first. Um, this is where he should be like, hmm, this is concerning. Mr. Elliot, isn't it true that you are the defense investigator on this case? It's true. Um, you work for Mr. Bowles and Ms. Gutierrez, and they are paying you. That's correct. Um, and as a person who is employed as the defense investigator, it is your job to aid in her defense. Isn't that true? That's true. Now, this is where I'm like, this is going to be good. Because normally if this is at the start, it's because of one of two things. It's because either um, you know that you can rip this guy a new one or because you don't have anything else other than you're a paid dude, right? But normally you, normally you want some lead in with most experts. You want to sort of start to undermine them before you get to it. And she is... This isn't just like, how much were you paid? This is the, you are a, a hired gun, you're here to help, and she's just going to unload on this guy. Now. And she, glasses go on. Glasses. You seem to take. <laughs> Look at this. I, I want to like, I want to save this just as like a, a bumper because glasses go on. Glasses you come seem off. to take an issue <laughs> with the fact that uh, Lieutenant Benavides touched the firearm with his ungloved hand. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Um, but you agree with me that unlike a lot of homicides or shootings, uh, this one occurred in the presence of upwards of a dozen people. That's true. So there was not going to be any mystery as to who had the gun and who pulled the trigger, correct? To that aspect, no. Uh, you seem to take issue with the fact that the projectile in this case can't be matched to the firearm, right? Only in the sense that to confirm that the firearm presented to law enforcement was the actual firearm. It doesn't really change uh, what happened? But oh, it doesn't really change anything, huh? Doesn't really change anything. Um, okay. Where's the controversy? What? What? what it, it, do you have some information that the jury hasn't heard that the gun that was fired by Mr. Baldwin is actually not the gun that was used? I haven't come across that. Have you? This is the kind of tone you only are breaking out when you just are a, are savaging a witness. Um, I've watched videos of dog attacks that were less, where I was like, were, you know, I was less like, ooh, than this, because, uh, yeah. And Jack Campbell says, I strongly disagree about the garbage. It's a remote ranch. Filming was frozen. Nobody was there. How would trash get taken? Because they struck the set. Everything was gone. Would a disposal service empty cans on set after a shooting? Should have looked. They, like, 
they it was over. It was done. Everything was gone. No, I was referring to when the officers arrived at the scene, they didn't know that other than what one person told them. Okay, but it turned out to be true. There's no controversy. The, the gun that was used in the shooting is the gun that was in Mr. Baldwin's hand, right? True. Okay. Um, and the reason that the projectile can't be matched to the firearm is because the projectile went through uh, two people and it was so heavily uh, uh, damaged because it went through two human beings, uh, there wasn't enough marking to match it to the bore of the gun. Isn't that true? That's true. And you see here, she gets to be like, it went through two human beings. That's not an accident in her choice of language, right? She's really getting to drop this. And I'm just going to say, this is a moment that a lot of lawyers really like because the feeling of having a witness that you just, you know, has been deceptive and you get to just kick the crap out of them is a really good feeling. You know this, and it. this is the thing that a lot of lawyers get too, um, too addicted to. And this is a good point. She's usually a defense attorney. And the reason why that's relevant here is that defense attorneys tend to be worse on direct examination because we don't do many of them and way better on cross because we do lots of crosses defense attorney work is cross-examination so yeah i think you deserve a super chat for how insane the defense weapons expert was we're going to talk about that i hope mrs runkle has the blood pressure meds nearby thank you for the recaps you've done a great job love seeing you on edb today also yeah it um we're gonna see that now in terms of um Fingerprints and DNA on the ammunition box. Sir, did you watch the video where Ms. Gutierrez actually says to Mr. Benavides, this is the box I was pulling from? Yes, I did. And that box is taken and put into Mr. Benavides's patrol unit, correct? The lieutenant placed it in his vehicle, yes. Right. So... Where's the controversy in terms of what box she was pulling from? Part of it was to find where the live ammo originated. That information may have been on the outside of the box. Could have had Seth Kenny's DNA, could have had Seth Kenny's fingerprints, or anyone else where the box came from originally. But, sir, didn't you watch the second interview with Ms. Gutierrez? where she actually held up a photograph for Corporal Hancock and said, this is a picture of our boxes of dummies. And not coincidentally, it matched identically to the box that she identified as the box that she was pulling rounds from that day. You watched that interview, didn't you? I love how there's two people with the same profile picture because apparently they follow the same uh, football club. And somebody asked, who's EDB? Emily D. Baker. She's also on YouTube, and she is fantastic. Uh, Pat says, motion to install bulletproof glass around the witness stand. We'll get to that. Um, I died of mortified laughter and demand the expert be charged accordingly. I can't just, I can't even, I just can't. Please help fund my gravestone. We'll get to that one. <laughs> Alexandra Little, Runkle, my flabber is gasted. I love it. Um, defense weapons expert has first class LARPing career. Uh, we're going to have some thoughts. Take a shot every time someone checks a judge. <laughs> Please like to help Runkle reach his pro bono goals. Uh, staying at a casino in Minnesota, decided this stream would be cheaper and more fun than the slots. That is true. Um, Ms. Pete, thank you for five gifted memberships. James C., these guys work with unions, help aiming at, help, hence aiming at the manager. Yep. Bye. One thirty. Please don't talk among yourselves or anyone else about the evidence received here in court. Thank you. Now, I'm just going to say, this is a bit of a dick move by the judge. This is a bit of a dick move because she's calling for lunch in the middle of this, of this cross-examination. You want to build a cross-examination. You want to... 
and you want to have that momentum across examination. You want to keep keep them on the ropes and keep pressure on. You don't want to give them a break. You don't want to um, you don't want to let them have any breathing room. And I have seen judges go off on counsel for improper objections that they thought were just purely for the purpose of interrupting a cross-examination, for a cell phone going off in the middle of a cross-examination that br breaks somebody's flow, um, for, I have seen a judge go off on somebody for standing up and saying, um, isn't it lunchtime? And the judge was like, you know better than this counsel. It's lunchtime when this cross-examination is done. Sit down. But the judge is like, now nah, we're just going to break up this guy's, this cross. Like, okay. So I, I was just like, they should have let her finish. And they should have said, hey, sorry, jury. It's going to be a late, um, it's going to be a late lunch. Like, you, you get lunch when you get lunch. But, um, yeah, we're, um, we're going to skip forward to the rest of the cross because this is, we haven't seen a good cross like we see this one. This is the this is the good cross here. Uh, Creek Native Girl, thank you so much for the gifted membership. Uh, now I'm wondering whereabouts you're located, if this is like, uh, or which group you're with. I initially thought that is Cree Native Girl. There's a lot of Cree in my area, so. Yeah, and somebody noted it seemed like a long lunch to me. It, it did. It was like 20 minutes longer than we expected, so... Um, yeah. All right, you may be seated. Wendy Wilkinson, thank you so much for the gifted uh, membership there. All right, Mr. Elliott, I, I, I want to uh, <laughs> just one. back up for, for a brief moment, and I want to go back to any concerns you had about the projectile not matching the gun. I'm not sure that I that, that I fully un his uh, his glasses are gone now. <laughs> this feels like the um, you know how in a video game after you beat up on a boss for a certain amount it'll be like the bot there's like a moment when the boss like their armor shatters or something and then it's like round two of fighting the boss. Um, this feels kind of like that because. You know, now his glasses are off. We're at, like, round two of this boss fight of cross-examination. ...understand what your concerns are in that regard. Would you articulate them for us again? Yes, I was referring to the concerns that a detective would have upon arriving at scene. Didn't You don't have the... I don't have guest plan for the, the LARP roast. the I results was, of lab I could. I could bring some so, people on if people want, but... And you have nothing guaranteed. Um, what do you mean, it, nothing guaranteed? Well... Thank you, Kayla. At the time, you had some people saying, this is the gun. But you didn't have any evidence, scientific evidence, showed that was the gun, which was later found to be true. Um, I'm just talking about, you, you have so many variables and so many unknowns that you can only use interviews on the scene to confirm and deny things. Uh, one person saying this is the gun, that may very well be the gun. But you have to... You see how his cadence has really changed? And he's like, uh, ooh, uh, 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 uh. Sir. <laughs> I think he's... I think that the break might have actually helped the cross. And the reason why is because this guy went for lunch and I think that this whole, the whole time during lunch, he was sitting there going, oh shit. Oh shit. She's got my number. Oh shit. Oh shit. Oh shit. And he comes back and he is, <laughs> he's just lost his composure. See if someone else can verify that. You know, later on, you're going to have lab results. Not at the time. And that's what I was referring to, is at the time... The defense the found the biggest the gun course. store FUD they could find so for an expert. So what's your yeah. concern, then, about the investigation that the Sheriff's Department did with regard to the gun? Um, it, it is your testimony that after Ms. Gutierrez identified the gun to Lieutenant Benavides and handed him the gun 
there should have been more follow-up with regard to whether or not that was really the gun. Is that what you're saying? Yes, because she's not the one that handed the gun to Mr. Baldwin. There are people in between that process. So Yes, he can't talk about his testimony coming up. Continue, sir. I apologize. All right. um, again, pieces of information come out as they're going through both processing the scene and interviewing people. And now we know that there is some time delay between the firearm being loaded, the firearm being on the cart, the firearm making it to uh, Mr. Baldwin inside the church. And that's what I meant by the investigation at the time. A lot of, a lot of information is coming out over months. Some information has come much later. But you agree with me that Ms. Gutierrez handed Lieutenant Benavidez the gun and said, this is the gun that was being used. And when she said that, she had been identified as the armor on the movie set. Yeah. Do you agree with that? I do. And you also agree that, not surprisingly, that turned out to be the gun. You agree with that? Oh, I do, yes. So any potential issues with regard to that specific concern of yours didn't turn out to be issues. We don't, there's no issue. You agree with that. This is the gun. This is the gun that fired that projectile. Correct. Uh, Bowles in the background here just has an expression of like, <sighs> and the thing is, is at this point, who remembers the great job, like the great morning that defense had? Defense had a good morning. They really had a good morning. And who remembers it? <laughs> you know, she is doing a fantastic job of eliminating that. And it's all, um, it's all thanks to this guy. Yes. Okay. Um, when we left off, uh, there was there was an objection, and, and I'm going to uh, go through with you. Um, you were talking about the uh, the ammo boxes. I think that was where the objection was. Here's a great comment here. Bulls looks like a Tums commercial. <laughs> He really does at this stage. Oh, man. Um, so, as the investigator in this case, uh, have you reviewed all of the body-worn camera footage? I have. It's, there's a lot. So have I. Yes. I love that I little smile. To the exhausted <laughs> look on your face. Uh, I'm going to show you what has been marked as uh, what is already in evidence as State's Exhibit 192. And, guys, there was this red dude in a red shirt earlier, and he just vanished now. I don't know where he's gone. <laughs> Sir, have you seen this exhibit? I have. And you agree with me that uh, th this is... Lieutenant Benavides is pointing to, to the box that Ms. Gutierrez identified as the box that she was pulling ammunition from. Do you agree with that? He is pointing to a box of ammunition, yes. Are, are you are you indicating you that, so that you believe uh, that that the box uh, here in this picture was not the box that she was pulling ammunition from? No, I'm not. Uh, there were two boxes, and I don't know if it was clearly delineated to him which of the two boxes was where the ammo was drawn from. Well, you understood that the gun was loaded with dummies, or was supposed to be loaded with dummies at the time of the incident, right? Right. And you also understand that this was the only box of dummies on the cart. You understand that, right? Yes. The other boxes were blanks, correct? Correct. And Ms. Gutierrez said to Lieutenant Benavides, this is the box I was pulling from, right? Yes. <laughs> you, you don't think that Ms. Gutierrez meant to say I was pulling from a, from a box of blanks when the gun was loaded with supposed dummies, do you? No, I don't. Okay. <laughs> She's just tearing him apart. Um, this is like watching a pit bull just drag somebody down the street by their leg. And the reason why she keeps putting her glasses on and off, by the way, is they're reading glasses. She's using them to read State the screen and she puts them away afterwards. 
Have you seen this photo? I probably have hundreds of photos of white boxes, but I, I can't that, specifically say this photo. Does the box on the left, does that label look familiar to you in your investigation in this case? It does. So based on your investigation, do you have any reason to believe that the box that Ms. Gutierrez pointed out to Lieutenant Benavides is not this box that he took and placed in his unit? I do not. And I believe that photo is taken in the unit, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah, I can see the seat. States Exhibit 63. You understand that this is a photo of that exact same box when it was taken into evidence at the Sheriff's Department, right? Yes, that's how, that how it <laughs> is how it's labeled, yes. I'm not asking how it's labeled. It, 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 you've reviewed uh, the evidence at the evidence room, right? Yes. And you've reviewed all the photographs that were taken on scene? Yes. I, all, I, there, uh, let me ask you, isn't mm -hmm. it true that there was only one box found with this label? Isn't that correct? That I don't know. Oh, you don't know. Okay, you're, cool. You're, you're the just... defense investigator on this case, right? Yes. <laughs> Have you seen photographs of a box that looks like this, uh, but is loaded with something other than what this box was loaded with? Do you, you, sir, do you have any reason to believe that there were two boxes with this label uh, that were taken into evidence? I do not know. Bowles is looking real sad. States Exhibit 69. Have you seen this photo? Again, I've seen dozens of photos. So. Oh, you've seen dozens of photos. Well, okay. You're, you're here to give an opinion. Uh, about the investigation on this case. Are, are you not familiar with this photograph? <laughs> She's just What's staring into okay. it. Uh, did, you, uh, did you watch the interview in November that Ms. Gutierrez gave to Detective Hancock? I did. And do you recall during that interview, Ms. Gutierrez holds up her phone and says, this is a picture of our dummies meaning the dummies that she would bring on the set. Do you recall that? I do recall that, yes. Do you, isn't, isn't this the photo that she showed? You don't know? Not at this point, no. Okay. Um, you, uh... Now, at this point, the jury either thinks he's incompetent because he doesn't know, or they think he's lying. And either of those is brilliant. Now, if you wonder why defense, like why lawyers sometimes jump into the hot cross when they can't deliver, it's because this is this is where a lawyer wants to be. This is where a lawyer really, really enjoys being. This is fun, and this is like this is a feeling of righteousness. You lying sack of crap, I am gonna tear you apart. So sometimes lawyers chase this feeling in situations where they can't get to where she is right now. And that gets you into a bad place. You don't want to do that. You weren't, uh, you, you weren't <laughs> watching the, the testimony of our expert, uh, Mr. Hawks, when he laid the foundation for this and indicated that this photograph was sent from a contact in her phone named Dad Kula uh, to her the day before the interview with Detective Hancock. Were you not aware of that? I was not, no. There's nothing to object to here. This is just, this is just your client, like your witness is on the ropes. There is no way to save them. And I tell witnesses, I say like sometimes um, you might have a bad, you might have a bad day and I, you can't necessarily look to me to save you. I'll object if there's an objection, but don't look to me. I'm not your rescuer. And Yeah. Every time defense gains ground, they crap the bed. They were doing good with the jury, and now the jury thinks the defense is hiding something and their witnesses are liars. Yep. And at 42.16, the guy behind Hannah and Camo picks his ears and then eats his own earwax. Ew. Um, and thank you, Nancy A. Yeah, this is... This is... She's just enjoying the hell out of this. Um, so... Sir, based on Ms. Gutierrez's statements, would it be her, her own statements to law enforcement, would it be reasonable for law enforcement to believe that States Exhibit 62, this box here in the foreground, is indeed the box she was pulling from because she said that? Wouldn't that be reasonable for law enforcement to believe that? Yes, it would. 
<laughs> and you understand that that box was determined to now i i'm just gonna uh what did they put up on the screen here popple recall primo kenny yeah you got to be careful with how you put these things up um by the way if you're ever using a computer in a trial um own a clean laptop own a, a laptop you'd use for nothing else because you don't want something uncomfortable here. Um, you don't want anything that is unrelated to this. So good job, State. It looks like they, they did that. And you understand that yeah, use a virtual that machine box is good advice was determined too. to have a live round. Yes. And you agree with me that that box that had the live round matches this photo that was shown to Detective uh, Hancock during the November 9th interview. You understand that? Yes, I do. You don't want to have a Vosh moment in a trial. Uh, and, I mean, the best way is just not to be a piece of crap like Vosh, but yeah. Sir, do you still have questions and concerns about how the live rounds got on set? I do. You, you, when... don't, you, you don't think that... You don't think that law enforcement can simply take Ms. Gutierrez's word for it, that this is her box, and this is the one she was pulling from, and this is the one where live rounds were found? Yes, but what we don't know is how many times those boxes were unloaded and reloaded. Every time that one of the firearms were loaded with dummy rounds, they came out of a box. They didn't necessarily go back into the same box. So you think Seth Kenny, because you mentioned Seth Kenny as like the DNA they might be looking for, um, you think Seth Kenny, like, um, wandered into the set from, like, however far the hell away he was, snuck in at night and tampered with things? Is that the theory? Or are you just reaching for, like, any, um, you know, any stick? Do you agree with me, sir, that there are certain things in homicide investigations that just simply can't be controlled for? You agree with that? Oh, absolutely. I really want to buy her a set of bifocals just so that she can stop. Like, glasses on, glasses off. Sir, what's the, what's the smallest police department you've ever worked for? Albuquerque PD. You agree with me that the Albuquerque Police Department is approximately 10 times the size of the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Department with regard to uh, the number of commissioned officers. By the way, this isn't a great example of, um, of you ask questions you know. She's already got his resume, right? She's seen his resume. She knows every police force this guy's ever worked for. And yeah, um, uh, Oblithian, I'm I'm not understanding what you're talking about here. So, um, yeah, you'll have to clarify what you're suggesting here. Um, she knows this answer, right? She knows it. I am. I think Albuquerque is around 850, and I think Santa Fe is 120, 130, something like that. Okay, more than eight times. Right. You agree with that math? I do. <laughs> this is the thing. Don't weasel the math because you will look worse weaseling the math. Like, oh, well, let's talk about the precise numbers. She's like, you agree it's more than eight times though, right? Have you ever worked on a homicide investigation on a movie set? I have not. Now this, I thought was a little dumber because the number of people who've worked a homicide set on a movie set is like very, very few. Um... There's no special training for movie set, just like there's no special training for a homicide at a bar or no special training for a homicide at a hospital or in a bathroom or whatever. Do you agree with me that normally in homicide investigations, police aren't concerned with where the live ammo came from? This case is unique in that regard, isn't it? This case is unique from the beginning, yes. Okay, it is, yes. right? It's mm -hmm. unique from the beginning. Uh, so... Police officers yeah, it actually gets clearer are not on the cross. trained in how to investigate homicides on movie sets where they're not supposed to have live rounds, they're supposed to have fake rounds. Cops aren't trained in that, right? Specifically, no. Okay. 
yeah, there is no specific training for like homicide at a specific location. Um, yeah. And you agree with me, don't you, that Lieutenant Benavides can't just let Ms. Gutierrez walk around the movie set with a firearm that appears to have just shot two people. You agree with that? Oh, I do agree with that reference to firearm, yes. Yeah, um, it, it was incumbent on Lieutenant Benavides to remove that firearm from her possession, correct? From anyone's possession, yes. <laughs> and you just take issue with the fact that he didn't put a glove on before he did it. Basically, yes. Uh, but you agree that the fact that he didn't put a glove on didn't turn out to create any significant evidentiary issues in this case because everybody knew who was holding the gun and everybody knew who shot the gun. You agree with that? I do. Sorry, then. It's all good. And, sir, you also agree with me, don't you, that a police officer's first responsibility is to save human lives, not collect evidence? Correct, as I stated, yes. And do you recall uh, that Ms. Gutierrez was actually checked by EMTs when she was uh, sitting in the back of Lieutenant Benavides's patrol unit? Yes, I did see that. This is <laughs> just such a slaughter. Phone calls? Such yes, a slaughter. Yes. Um, I think you, you indicated uh, that you talked a little bit about um, that Detective Hancock sort of took possession of Ms. Gutierrez. Do you recall the statement that you made in that regard? I do. So I want to ask you, and one of the, one of the examples you gave was that Detective Hancock even, even accompanied Ms. Gutierrez to the restroom, right? Yes, she did. Um, but in watching the body-worn camera footage, isn't it true that Sergeant Christopher Zook tells Detective Hancock um, she doesn't want to go to the bathroom alone, will you take her to the bathroom? Ms. Gutierrez actually asks to be accompanied to the bathroom. Do you recall that? I do. He's looking real nervous. Um... He's looking real nervous. Also, apparently, Earwax Man does something. I do. I want to go to the bathroom. Tells Detective Hancock. Um, ah, he scratches his face. She doesn't want to go to the bathroom alone. Will you take her to the bathroom? Ms. Gutierrez actually asks to be accompanied to the bathroom. Do you recall that? I do. <laughs> And do you agree with me that it was Ms. Gutierrez who asked to be placed in Detective Hancock's patrol unit? That wasn't something that the police just unilaterally did with her. No, she did. She did ask. Is there a problem with them granting her request that she be accompanied to the bathroom? No, but I didn't think that included going into the bathroom with her. And... Like he gets this smile, like I think I've, I think I've done well. Like I think I'm doing good here. She, can I, can I elaborate? Sure. He thinks she, he's I got. Believe she he thinks he's got her on the ropes. She didn't want to talk to anyone from production, so it's kind of like if she was with Detective Hancock, she wouldn't be approached by any of her coworkers. I think that was her intention of being escorted. But I didn't think it included going into the bathroom itself. Well, he thinks he's going to recover. He thinks he's going to get like get his inertia back here. She went into the bathroom and she had her back turned to Ms. Gutierrez. What's the big deal? Ms. Gutierrez asked for an escort. What? 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 How did that hurt the investigation? Hurt the investigation? Yeah. It did not. <laughs> Gutierrez stayed on set and she was sitting in a police car with the door open and there was a, 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 a co-worker of hers sitting in there visiting with her. You agree with that? Yes, I do. And she had her phone. You agree with that? Yes. She was allowed to make phone calls. Yes. She was never placed in handcuffs. You agree with that? Correct. So what, what's problematic about that? How was she mistreated by police? I didn't say she was mistreated. Um, you certainly implied it there, son. It's all every appearance of not being free to leave. Um, Thank you, Elliot. 
In fact, I based that on the fact that when Lieutenant Benavides would step away. Didn't you just say everybody needs to be segregated and kept control of, and now you're upset that she's not free to leave? And that he's following? Oh, my God. Dude, keep your bullshit straight. Um... From his vehicle, he would tell a deputy to keep an eye on her. Uh, if she's free to leave and she's just sitting in the back of the unit with an open door, she should be allowed to walk away if she wanted to. And talk it, to other witnesses, which you just said nobody else can. When you're not free from constant observation from the law enforcement. Well, but isn't it true that she seemed to be having a panic attack and it was appropriate for Lieutenant Benavides when he walked away to ask another officer to keep an eye on her to make sure she's okay? At Isn't that, that true? At that time, she appeared fine. Did she? she looked fine to me. Cool. She? Is that a yes? That's a yes. So, was it your expectation that Mr. Baldwin should have been detained? Do you, do you believe that they should have detained him? I do. And, and do you believe that they should have put him in a police car and, and, and uh, taken his phone away? Not outside a place in a police car, but he should have been segregated from the other witnesses. And his phone should have been taken to preserve evidence. Don't you agree with me that there has to be probable cause that there may be evidence on the phone before the phone can be taken? But they wouldn't know if there was going to be evidence on the phone without interviewing him. There was no other way. Um, we need to take the phone without probable cause? Are you fucking kidding me? We're past two hours. Are you... F oh my... We need to take the phone on the possibility that there might be evidence? Um... That is defense lawyer here. Most of the time I'm representing bad people and they might have stuff on their phone that they really don't want the cops to find stuff like their communications where they are selling drugs. Um, and, um, if the police say we took his phone on the possibility that there might be evidence on it, I'm like, yes, please. Um, we're going to have fun with this. Um, like, you know, you know we started searching the phone not, because maybe there'd be the evidence. When law enforcement arrived. So who was he talking to? Well, did you look at his call logs? That's after the fact. I'm talking about when... Deputies arrived at the scene. Okay. I so after the fact, it might have been better to do this, but it didn't matter. So who gives a... Like, this is literally the worst Monday morning quarterbacking because all of the stuff he's concerned about is completely meaningless. I appreciate that. But what I'm trying to figure out is what about your concerns actually turned out to be real issues with the investigation? <laughs> what... what, what what, what evidence uh, was missing or hidden by Mr. Baldwin? What evidence do you have? We don't have the full contents of his phone. Has the defense filed any kind of a motion in this case to try to get the full contents of his phone? That I don't know. And you understand, though, that a full extraction of Mr. Baldwin's phone was done in New York, but we were given limited a limited report. You understand that? Yes, I do. And you also understand that uh, originally the same thing happened with Ms. Gutierrez. Uh, a limited report was generated from a full extraction, correct? Yes. Okay. So we have the same thing for Gutierrez as we do for Baldwin. Is free to issue subpoenas and file motions to compel and do all of those things in a case if they feel that they're missing evidence. Yes, I'm aware of that. And aren't you the investigator? Like, wouldn't you investigate? So do you think that it would have been appropriate then for law enforcement to take Ms. Gutierrez's phone away from her and not let her make a phone call to her mother? That can be monitored also. I have, I've seen it done both ways. I've seen them taken away where they're not allowed to make any phone calls. And I've also seen where they've been able to make call in the presence of law enforcement. I'm glad you made it to the scotch before that. Sir, generally in your experience as a law I'm enforcement have some officer, too. Uh, do you usually continue to investigate an individual for a crime? Um, after you have, let's say for months, after you have been unable to develop a single lead that that person was involved? 
Do you need me to rephrase that question? I, I think <laughs> I understand your question. You're saying, do you continue an investigation of someone that has, you have no information? Yeah, right. You looked, crime? you looked, you executed a search warrant, you interviewed the person numerous times, and you just simply don't have any evidence that they were involved. At some point, don't they just not become a suspect anymore? I don't know if that's the correct phrase, but well, but your, invest correct. Your, your investigation is over. You can take the investigation as far as you can go. Right. So at some point with Mr. Kinney, they executed a search warrant, they interviewed him numerous times, and they didn't come up with anything. So what do you think they should have done to continue? I, I just... At that point, there wasn't much further they could go. And, sir, are you aware that uh, the FBI will not do um, DNA testing on, uh, on um, rounds, whether they're spent or unspent? Were you aware of that? I heard about it in this case, but they have done DNA testing on casings, unspent casings. Well, weren't you present? Were you present for a pretrial interview uh, of, uh, of the, the DNA expert in this case? I was. And you heard her during the interview state that they won't do this kind of DNA testing, correct? I did. All right. <laughs> this guy's face on all the Brunkle's pigeons in the pigeon business video. <laughs> I love that. Hannah's leaning over. She's like, I don't think he's doing very well, is he? And Bowles is like, yeah, no, this is bad. <laughs> Agree with me, sir, that um, police officers, when they arrived on scene, they knew immediately who the shooter was. I think that information arrived shortly after the first deputies arrived, but it was before the lieutenant arrived. There's a little lag there, but and not, not much time at all. Okay, and Mr. Baldwin didn't leave the scene, did he? He did not. You testified on direct examination that there was a person who left the scene that was never identified. Do you recall making that statement? I did, and that was based on uh, what came out of some of the interviews. Thank you, Roro. Um, I don't quite recall. I think Lieutenant asked if we had everybody. And what one, Lieutenant? Well, Lieutenant talking? Benavides. Okay. And one of the deputies responded with, one left. And I think he asked who that was, and the deputy didn't know. <laughs> but you know, don't you? Because you interviewed him and you asked him. Didn't you interview Reed Russell? And when you interviewed Reed Russell, he told you that he left so that he could go to the hospital to be with his close friends. And let's, let's, let's put this at one speed and go back. Because remember, he set up this mystery, right? We've got the murder on the Orient Express where there's this mystery person who might have, you know, might have been the the shooter on the grassy knoll. Lieutenant, Lieutenant Benavides. Okay. And one of the deputies responded with, one left. And I think he asked who that was and the deputy didn't know. Okay, so, so now we're getting know, to this mystery person. Don't you? Because you interviewed him and you asked him. Didn't you interview Reed Russell? And when you interviewed Reed Russell... He told you that he left so that he could go to the hospital to be with his close friends. And before he left, he gave all of his contact information to the police. You interviewed him. Do you recall that? I did. Do you need to see a copy of the interview? I don't. <laughs> and you also understand that Mr. Russell, who left the scene to go to the hospital, was interviewed the very next day by Detective Cano. Aren't you aware of that? I am, yes. So what's the mystery? Who's the mystery man that left the set? He, he was identified, right? <laughs> he can't even answer. Correct? Mr. Russell was identified, but I was never quite clear if it was the same individual. Even though you asked him and he said, I'm the guy that left the set to go to the hospital? Yes, but did he know he was the only one who left? <laughs> All right. She laughs. He laughs. It's like, sir, you don't laugh. You are the joke. The joke doesn't laugh. <laughs> We're just going to keep inventing mystery people as they as they go. It's like, um, sir, y y no, you should not be laughing now. You should be like, Throwing your resume in a fire. Yeah. Um, thank you, Mr. Elliot. I'll pass the witness. 
Now, I'm going to skip past this because, um, what is that? I'm going to skip past this because we're, we'll see, um, we'll see Bowles make a brief effort at playing Jesus and, like, raising the dead because, <laughs> I'm sorry, like, there is nothing you can do. Um, this guy isn't just Lazarus. He's dead and buried and the corpse is set on fire and the ashes have been thrown into a river and the river has flown into the sea and the sea has evaporated and the planet has fallen into the sun. This guy is done. Like, there is no coming back from this. Um, yeah, the... Like... Okay, cool. Um, I need more scotch. This is not good scotch. But it we're we're getting to the next guy because defense defense is already sitting here like I'm having a bad day. I'm having a really bad day. And I'm going to tell you, when when they were done with this investigator, my thought was, at least it can't get any worse. At least at this point, there's nowhere to go but up. And and then they surprised me. They, they really surprised me because they found a way to go all the way into stupid town. Um, so let's skip to our next guy here. Um, now, I don't know if this tie is... I should show you guys the tie. I don't know if this tie is, like, a, a nod to Ukraine, or if this tie is just that, like, it's a self-defense tie because you can't attack this guy because the tie is so garish that they're... that you can't even look at it. Um... Yeah, and this is the other fun question. Um, is he wearing a holster? I don't know. We never find out what's going on here, but... Um, oh. Um, and I'm just going to note, we are officially in spicy time. Let's go. <laughs> Good afternoon. Can you please tell the jury your name again? Frank Lewis Blair Kuski the <laughs> third. Okay, he's making sure we know the third. Um, by the way, I have two middle names. When I have been on the stand testifying, which has happened, I give my name as Ian Runkle. <laughs> because, like, okay, like, uh, I already was getting a feeling of, like, this guy's going to start dropping his LSAT score in a minute, but... Um, <laughs> it's going to get fun. Where do you currently reside? Carmel Valley, California. And what do you do for a living, sir? I'm managing director of Blair Financial Group, money managers. So this guy's a gun guy who voluntarily lives in California. This is already, I'm spotting some inconsistencies here. Uh, <clears throat> I want you, um, outside of your management in, in Blair Financial, to tell the jury um, about your experience with period firearms. Yeah. Now, I was already wondering, like, what the hell? Why are we talking about a financial guy? Um, and, yeah. Um, why do we have a financial guy here? So, yes, but... Um, I, prior to... Let me... Check a note to make sure dates are correct. Um, My dude, this is already a bad start. You're sitting there and you're like, hey, um, I I want to, um, you know, I, like, tell me your history. Tell us your experience. And he's like, I need my notes for this. If <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute. Why do you need notes to know what your experience is? Why? Oh, is Emily here? Has she been summoned? I missed... You arrived just in time. You arrived just in time. But this guy is pulling out his notes for, like, where the hell have I been? What am I doing? It's like, 
no, sir. You tell us where you are. Um, and I am going to move myself. That's good enough. All right, let's... Uh... I took part in my uh, first uh, movies in this, which were done with... Uh... And, and I'm not talking about the movies. Also, sir, do you not own a printer? <laughs> like, he's got hand... I use that same paper for, like, my grocery list. <laughs> Sir, you're in court. Get a printer. <laughs> like, come on. Oh, my God. Oh, uh, let me just, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, let me just try to center my question. Yeah. I'm still objecting. Okay. I'm still objecting. Yep. All right. Let's get some super chats while they're doing this. Uh, Elizabeth Webster, uh... This for your evening traps. You, Rob, and EDB help a lot. Thank you so much. Uh, I think that was supposed to be recaps. It looks like that was typed on a phone. POV with roving cyclops. This prosecutor is much better than some other ones I've seen. She's not someone to tangle with. Also, hello, fellow Edmonton content creator. We should chat because um, that is cool. Uh, Brentwood Sheik, thank you for the 10 gifted memberships. Roro, thank you for five gifted memberships. Cachette, uh, happy to be here among friends. I... I hope that this is a friendly community. That's sort of what I aim for here. Allison Lee, thank you so much. Uh, Karate Cat Mom, thank you for the five gifted memberships. Jaffla Beats, who supervises the supervisor? The supervisor, supervisor. It's, it's supervisors all the way down. They're like turtles. Um, Isaac, similar to NLRB, okay, OSHA I is just, completely uh, captured by anti-business radicals. Um, yeah. I want to go just give the jury an overview of your experience with firearms. And not necessarily getting into movies yet, but your experience with firearms and period firearms and how you obtain that familiarity. Do you wish for the long explanation or the short? No, the short. <laughs> okay, so we're going to get the short explanation. That's good, right? We want the short explanation. Um, I'm going to move myself even further up into the corner here. Um, there we go. So we're going to get the short explanation. And it's going to be, it's going to start in the beginning. The earth was formless and void. <laughs> sure. It's always better. My father was a combat MP in the Second World War. <laughs> Do you want the short explanation? And it starts with where the sperm came from. <laughs> Sir, <laughs> what the hell? Like, the short explanation should not begin before conception, my dude. <laughs> Start at the beginning doesn't mean that far back. <laughs> I was shooting almost from birth. I was sent to rifle camp in Butte, Montana at age six, which is hard to imagine. I grew up around a hunting family. My grandfather was a big time hunter. I grew up hunting deer and pheasants with my uncle in the forests of Ohio. I had Ohio and Indiana and Pennsylvania hunting licenses ever since they were required. Job search tip, folks. Um, keep your resume to two pages. There's a reason why, like, I have volunteer experience and, like, work experience in high school that is not on my resume anymore because you don't go that far back. Um, there should not be anything that is, like, your womb um, should not be mentioned in your resume. Nobody cares that you hunted as a kid, dude. Nobody cares that you were in the Boy Scouts. Um, I, I, what was the long version? Like, do you actually have a flow chart about the your conception in the long version? Do you go into, like, that you are... Uh, I don't know. I was a member. Uh, I was a Boy Scout rifle over a merit badge winner. I worked... Um, was a member of the Kenyan College of Rifle Team. Following uh, graduation from Kenyan College, I uh, took up firearms in a very serious way, beginning collecting and shooting. I was trained by Louis Tenenbaum, uh, essentially right out of college, who was a member of the U.S. Army Marksmanship Unit, who thought I was worth taking his time with that. Nobody cares who he is unless you're going to explain, and I guess that would get us into the long version? Um... I appeared in a uh, number of little television shorts and things like that through that time period. And when I really got going on... Pre 
Wait, he just said he was in television shorts. Judging by this, those shorts were like 18 hours long. <laughs> Primitive firearms, and I won't even talk about self-defense guns at this point. I was trained yes, right. in combat guns. Um, I first appeared in the George Washington television miniseries in 1984, and I was assigned my role as a, a surveyor in the wilderness, and of course, I had my first real flintlock in my hands at that time. I, during the earlier times, had shot a lot of primitive weapons, prim primarily flintlocks. Uh, black powder stuff was very interested in that. And By the way, flintlocks are completely irrelevant to this because nobody in this movie is using a flintlock. Um, like, get to the... F He's been at this for like t what feels like 20 minutes, and we still haven't gotten to the After actual that, point. I got going, and I joined a group called the First American Regiment in 1985, which was the premier uh, late 18th century, early 19th century reenactors for military reenactment. And So let's talk about what military reenactment is. They go and they demonstrate, you know, old battles. Um, now, if these guys were demonstrating... You know, this is basically, uh, what is it, the SCA for guys who are really obsessed with, like, the U.S. Civil War. Um, I might have asked him which side he w he's on just to, uh, you know, Sir, uh, when you do your Civil War reenactment, are, are you, which, which color uniform are you wearing? <laughs> um, that might be an awkward question. During this time, and I believe you have a nice picture of me firing cannons, I became a surgeon of artillery doing reenactment. Sir, um, no one has a nice picture of you. Big time. And in that capacity, I appeared in lots of movies. I fired artillery. This is 18th century artillery. I fired at the 1812 Overture with Cincinnati Symphony in various performances in big stadiums and things. I also... Um, <clears throat> sorry for the cough. I also answered questions for NBC Nightline fairly routinely on weapons identification because. Of oh, gee, you were on the news. Um, great. Like, you know, all sorts of idiots are on the news. I'm going to be on the news tomorrow, I think, or at least on something. Um, that doesn't make you an expert. Of course, I'm fairly good expert in Russian weapons and one of the largest collectors in the United States. I took part with 1st American Regiment in many, many, many different film productions, television productions, that sort of thing, which were done by PBS and uh, I believe the History Network. These were uh, shown at the time on television and also became educational movies programs. They sold the rights to us, charging with bayonets to all kinds of ad agencies. I, okay, let me stop you for a second. Yeah. Is it? There's a lot. Let of... me stop you for a second because nobody gives a damn, sir. Get to the point. Um, so, yeah. Information. Oh, and, no, I'm uh, sorry. <laughs> no, it's a. It's okay. Uh, but I wanted to ask you in the course of that, and you've had a whole lifetime. Is that fair to say? Yes, it is. I'm gonna. Uh, have you been a collector also of period type weapons? Yes, very much so. Okay. Are you familiar with the uh, revolver in this case, uh, the 45 Long Colt? Absolutely. Did you bring uh, with you today um, that revolver? Not that revolver, but a revolver just like that revolver? Yes, we would call that a sister. It is made by Pieta, the same exact company. It was nearly sequential serial numbers. It is absolutely identical. Any part would interchange, and it will look exactly like the Baldwin gun. So I bought the same thing, right? Um, fair enough. He bought... Now, this guy owns a bunch of guns. He shoots. I'm like, where's your actual expertise other than just you bought a gun, sir? Um, I didn't actually hear expertise here. It's just I've got money to buy a bunch of guns, and I bought the same gun. Did you also bring a, a replica gun? With yes, you? I did. And can you tell the jury just, first of all, what, sure. what that is? This is a Denex replica. Denex is a company in Spain that makes replicas of anything from shotguns to anti antique weapons to swords, things like that. They're used by reenactors. They're used in movies. Uh, there was a Denex revolver on the set of Rust that was used 
as one of the dummy guns. There were in fact 10 non-firing replica guns on the set uh, that looked like this. Um, so it can't shoot, but it looks like it. It functions, it cocks the cylinder turns, and from five feet away you couldn't tell unless okay. you really look. Okay, sir, uh, let me, if I can. You can, like, this expression on his face is frustration because this is the guy is realizing that this witness is somebody he has no control over because his expert doesn't want to help him. His expert wants to show off how much he knows. His expert really wants to tell the jury how much, you know, Frank, whatever, Kuski the third uh, money manager at whatever knows his guns and how important he is and all of those. So, um, yeah. Um, and Bowles is already like, this guy's going to go off the rails on me because I need him to answer the questions. I, and you can do witness prep, but this guy is now running away from this and, you know, this is becoming a problem. Yes, I was going to um, ask at this time, Your Honor, if I could tender him as an expert in the categories I previously did. Well, why don't you state him on the record again? Yeah, I was making sure I had the exact wording. Is that okay if I, yeah, you wrote those down? Because I don't want to change it. Right, well, I'll just say it again. It's, again, it's firearm identification. Firearm functioning, reloading. Sir, you should have this written down. This isn't a pop quiz. This should be on your, this should be the top of your prep sheet. What you're tendering this guy for. You, you. Oh. Of ammunition and identification of ammunition of dummy rounds and live rounds. Any objection? I'm just going to tell you, I would object to this. Um, we haven't heard anything that gives them any expertise about identifying dummies versus live or anything about ammunition or anything about reloading or any, yeah. Uh, no objection... Uh, within the confines of what we discussed at the bench. All right, thank you. Yes, I understand. About the only reason I can see why she isn't objecting to this guy, because I would object to this guy, is... Um, and I am in the wrong place. There we go. Um, the only reason I can see to not object to this guy is just, like, maybe she's got his number and figures that this is going to be, um, you know, a disaster, because it is. Yeah. So... But like, uh, sir, sir your, you will, your merit badge is not worth anything. For these specific areas, subject to the ruling up at the bench. Thank you. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, sir, if you will, if you... Now, I got to say, I am dying to know what the ruling was up at the bench. Like, was it that he's not allowed to testify about stuff that happened before he was born? Or what? Um, yeah, this is what happens when all the legitimate armorers think your client is guilty as hell. The Civil War and Russian weapons expert... Yeah, um, this guy is something else. Um, you could, um, have her, the deputy handles this, but if you could retrieve your, the firearms from behind you. Do it in public, and I will. We're going to take this right down. Oh, we're at normal speed. Clarify that it is not loaded. Okay, you're clarifying that it's not loaded. That's spiffy. Um, I I need to... You're clarifying that it's not loaded. Great. Um, we're going to put this at... This is like the only time I'm going down to three-quarters speed. It's a real... Mr. Kuski, are you able to... Uh, take the cylinder out so you can show everyone also that it's it's unloaded. Yes, I can. Okay. So here's the thing. He's got it in a cloth case. Um, I would have that case, like, that you can tell which direction the gun is pointed from that case. What I'd be doing at this stage is setting the case facing the back wall. Um, and then he's pulling another item out. A hammer. 
And here is a Genex revolver. Whoa! Um, let's go back and watch that again. Here is a Re Denex revolver. Is a Denex revolver. Now, I don't know for certain, but it looks like he just flashed, like that he just muzzle swept the, you know, the deputy. And you know what's behind the deputy is the jury. I see people saying in Biggin, we need to see this guy. Um, so, and now he's waving it around in the air. All right, first of all. Whoa! Dude! <laughs> um, I'm going to object. Where does he point it? Um, straight forward into the, into the audience, um, including, that's the prosecutor. That's the prosecutor's chair. That's, like, no. Don't do that. Everybody's nervous. Yeah, we're going to hear this at real time just so that the voice is there. Um, when I am calling an expert on gun anything, what I don't want is what just happens all, here. Everybody's nervous because you have not demonstrated to us that they are unloaded. So before you start showing us the weapons, make sure they're unloaded, including that one that you just touched. You see his expression? Eh. Like, watch watch his expression to this. Watch his expression. Make sure they're unloaded, including that one that you just touched. He's like, wh why are you being mean to me? Now, um, the one he's handling, I'm pretty sure, is the fake gun. But you still don't mess around with a fake gun like this, especially when nobody knows in the courtroom which one is which. So you gotta demonstrate this first. And some, like, nobody in the courtroom has been told which is which, right? Watch what happens right now. So he picks up the gun, and he's got it pointed through, like we can draw a line here, through this at the deputy's legs and also at his hand. That is not appropriate. And he's showing the judge. And then he just sweeps. <laughs> Let's watch this again. Sweeps over at... Points up at the judge... <laughs> Uh, but <laughs> sir do you have any idea how lucky you are right now because I am pretty sure that a lot of the deputies would be just taking that gun away from you and beating the out of you with it that is insane to be pointing that at the judge and he's lucky that this deputy was just like, sir, down, down with the gun. And you know who's watching this? Um, prosecutor's watching this. Prosecutor sees this. <laughs> prosecutor's taking notes. Um, now, if I was the judge and he just pointed the gun at me, he's done. It's like, sir, you're out. Um, bailiff sees the guns, return the guns to him at the courthouse door, leave, like, he's not in my courtroom anymore. He might be in cells. Um. <laughs> so now he's showing the deputy that it's clear. Finally, we're getting to that with it in a safe direction. And then he puts his hand over the muzzle. Oh, and now he's muzzling the, uh, the, points it back towards the, the, the gallery before he turns it around again. What the hell? And now he pulls out, this is the real gun. And the deputy hands it to him being mindful. What does he do? 
He's got it pointed at his hand. You do not point the gun at your hand. Do not allow the muzzle to cover anything you don't wish to destroy. Sir, do you not like that hand? Is that not your favorite hand? Um, like, okay, um, why? And now he's got it pointed right at his crotch as he turns. Okay, now we're doing a little better. He's got it aimed a little side. There we go. And he was about to point it at the gallery again. Nope. And now he's got his uh, clearing, like his little clearing rod there. Oh, waving the gun around, showing us what he's doing, talking. He's having a whole conversation about this that we can't hear. Um, no, the sound is off because they're at a sidebar. Now they're zooming in on the guns here. Rewind, he explains it, man. I don't care if he says it's a, uh, a dummy, that he says it's unloaded. You don't do that in court. Like, I'm sorry. This guy makes Binger look like a pro. Yeah. Um, defense witness has <laughs> defense's gun safety practices. He's here to make Hannah Gutierrez look good by comparison. She's like, oh my god. This is the feeling of, I have the worst lawyers. <laughs> I have the worst lawyers. Like, oh. She's just like, oh my god, I'm going to jail. I am going to jail. <laughs> I never thought I'd miss Poot's gun handling. And you see the gallery is laughing at him. Um, even if it's not real, should he treat it like it is real for those who don't know? Yes. Like, yes. Um, I see. Uh, look, this guy won several merit badges in the 1960s. Uh, where did that comment go? Uh, it scrolled past. Um, yeah. Everybody is joking about this moment. They're joking about... You could, like... Watch the gallery here. They're laughing about this. They're laughing at how, you know... And I'm going... Oh, oh. Oh. Oh, my God. Um, It just... Oh, my God. And this guy's sitting here like he's still important. Oh, my God. Uh, somebody was saying, can we get a rewind? The deputy was glued to his set for the rest of his show and tell. Everyone lost confidence in the Boy Scout. Yep. All right, we got audio back again. Okay, Mr. Kissy, uh, I want to make sure that... Um... Now, I want to tell you, if I'm defense, there is a way I deal with this witness. After he's pointed the gun at everybody, um, I when they go up for this big sidebar, I'm just like... Um, you know, you don't need to do the sidebar. You don't need to do the sidebar because my response, like, I'm just going to say I have no questions for this witness. This should never, ever happen. This is their gun expert. This is their firearms expert. They needed this guy to be absolutely trustworthy, and instead he starts off getting chewed out by the judge and being unable to figure out how to actually properly show the guns to be safe and the deputy has to correct him repeatedly. Oh. I'm sorry. Like, this is... Uh, and I see... Uh, 
We're criticizing or kicking out an expert witness could be grounds for an appeal. If I was the judge, I'd be like, he's got a gun pointed at me. He's out. And I don't think any appellate court will criticize you for having called out, uh, you know, the expert for pointing a gun at you in court. Um, who did it the worst, Binger or this guy? Well, Binger is Binger. And so, um, I've never handled a gun in my life, and I know better than this. The overconfidence of a man who's never been correct in his life. Jesus, effing, yeah. Um, did anyone in the courtroom duck? We didn't see, but, I mean, oh. One, first of all, the Denix is the replica that's not firing. That is obviously clear it cannot fire, correct? Yes, I wish to demonstrate. Okay, but I, and just I, let, me, let me lead the question. I wish to demonstrate, and the guy's like, "No, sir, I am the I am the lawyer. Stop trying to show off." Sure. Um, the other Pieta, you cleared with the deputy, but I want you to be able to take that cylinder out so we can show everyone it's clear. Is that absolutely? Okay. Got it pointed in a safe direction. Oh, good. Now you've got it pointed in a safe direction, and let's look at Bowles' expression here. I want you to... Bowles is starting to get like a thousand yard stare here as he's like, Oh my God, I am... I, I am... Oh. Um, and yeah, those firearms should never have made it into the courtroom without being inspected and safety flagged by law enforcement. I was shocked that those... That he brought these guns in and that they weren't zip tied to hell. Um, like these guns, when they were brought in, should have just been made inoperable with zip ties or trigger locks or cable, like you can't cable lock this particular style of firearm, at least not easily, unless it's a really thin cable lock, it's a pain in the ass. Um, I'm just like, this should, this should not have been allowed. Um, this should not have been allowed. The judge is sitting there thinking, like, I could I could be shot by this dude. And, yeah, Bowles is just like, oh, my God. Um, what do we do? Be able to take that cylinder out so we can show everyone it's clear. Is that? Absolutely. Who set him up? He set him up. Got his point in a safe direction. Now, if we can get this pin out, the cylinder is retained. The cylinder is retained by a pin. Once that pin is removed, the gun may be put in a partially cocked position. The cylinder may be pushed out, and again, the barrel's safe. You can look right straight through it. Um, watch what he does here again. I mean, at this point, the gun can't fire because the cylinder's out, but watch his muzzle discipline. The cylinder may be pushed out, and again, the barrel's safe. You can look right Whoop. straight. Right towards, that's, you know, he's now aimed like wandering in the direction of the jury. That's right. So Whoops. would you take that and show them all? <laughs> he just realizes, oh, maybe I shouldn't. Like, And that was definitely at the bailiff there. It's empty. Is that acceptable? It's up to the court. No. Yes. Okay. No, the deputy is no. not involved no. in okay. this. Okay. It's he still has no muzzle discipline. He's still got no control over this so gun. It, it is empty. I demonstrated it's empty. Okay. okay. May I return it to the yes. firearm? You know what, Bullion? We just saw a little brief view of Bullion there in the corner. Uh, Bullion, who's sitting there, like, work, reading his emails and whatever else, he's sitting there going like, oh, my God, I'm so glad this is not me. Somebody said, how would you have dealt with this? Well, I, I, I've already sort of mentioned, he's got the cases, and the cases clearly show a direction. You pull the cases out such that they're aimed at the wall. You immediately tell the court, I'm proposing to, to like remove the gun and I will show it to be clear with the deputy. You know, these are pre-cleared guns, but I will, and you know what? I would have had them, like, I would have had this cylinder already out of the gun, like the actual gun. Um, like, just, oh. Bullion sitting there like, it's a good day to not be, and not be involved in this trial.
But yes, let's imagine that this thing is our our gun, right? Um, let's imagine that this is our gun. I'm going to embiggen myself for a second. So I am pulling this thing out and, you know, it's in a case. Um, where's a good case? Do I have a good case here? Um, all right. Um, I don't have a good case. Mm. Glasses case. Does it have glasses in it? It does not. All right. Glasses case is my case. This thing is my gun in the case. So I am pulling it out and I am aiming it away from the gallery towards the wall. I am say I'm letting the, the bailiff know I'm going to be pulling out the gun right now. And so you pull it out. You turn it downwards away from everybody. It has crossed nobody. You open the gun. You show it clear with the bailiff. You get the bailiff to confirm that. And then without moving it anywhere else, you remove the cylinder and you can show everyone. And nobody ever <laughs> gets flagged. Like, but instead he's just like, well, we're just going to wave it at everybody. It, oh my God. Oh my God. <sighs> now I can say, um, I had a police officer in a in a case who had worse gun safety practices than this because he insisted every time on pointing the gun at me and he was doing that specifically to be um to try to intimidate me and that ended when I threatened to arrest him on the stand so <laughs> So now he's fidgeting with his gun he's fiddling with it just have it broken down. That's also a perfectly acceptable thing, but he needs it assembled here. Okay, sir. Now, the first thing I want to ask you, um, comparing the Dennis... I pew -pewed the sheriff, but I didn't pew, -pew the, the deputy. ...to the, real, the, the Pieta, do they share some of the same characteristics? Yeah. All right. Now, who's listening to this guy after he's just been embarrassed um, by the court? Mm, nobody. Like... Yes, they do. And... Can you tell the jury, is the Denix made to look like the Pieta? Absolutely. And side by side, uh, if you can, and Your Honor, may he step down to show the, the jury? Yes. Okay. Now, you want to talk about some other stupid things? Sir, if you Watch can this. show them the Pieta and the Denix side by side, just so they can see. This is a Denix. And the deputy's got him... Now, he was just asked to show it side by side, and he's doing it one at a time. But the deputy's on him, like, now. The deputy is not having any patience with this. It is a replica, totally unfiring with a block barrel. It functions completely like a regular revolver. The cylinder turns, it will cock, it will snap and fire. It's unable to fire any ammunition. It's used as a... If I was the judge, he'd be staying in an entirely different box. It would be like, listen... Um, he's going into custody, but you can have him testify via video link from cells if you want. <laughs> like, I, uh, yeah, I would just be like, I don't trust this guy to touch the guns in, in my courtroom. Sorry. Replica, it's made of metal, and it functions just like a single-action army Colt, but it can't fire. I'll bring the next one, and then we'll compare them. So the um, defense witness list shows Thel Reed, care of Bowles Law Firm, at Bowles Office address. Means Thel's is also uh, represented by Bowles Office here. If so, conflict of interest, given Thel's uh, inventory, might be the source of live rounds. I don't know if Thel is being represented by them, but I think that's just like that's just provided as a mailing address. Again, in the same position. This is a P8 revolver. This is the sister gun to the Baldwin gun. It's a 45 caliber single action 1870. And you see Bowles now is watching him like a hawk because it's like, is this guy going to flag the jury again? Is this guy going to, like, what's he going to do? Three revolver, like was issued to Custer's troops. It is a true 45 long Colt. We call it just Colt. And it was designed for the U.S. Army to be able to kill a man and a horse. And it was the most popular firearm. In hey, Western hey, movies. Thank you, Mr. Kiski. If you could. Now, may I show the two together? 
Uh, yes, if you will just show what, but not with that, not with testimony, but just showing the. Please stop narrating about Custer, you giant. <laughs> like, defense wants to have some control over this witness, and instead he's just like, let me tell you about freaking Custer. If, if the reason why the prosecutor isn't objecting, like no question was asked, is because they know this guy is making himself look like an idiot, right? If this guy was doing well, the prosecution would be like, uh, objection, no question. But instead, it's like, but yeah, this deputy is entirely tired of his shit. Now, pro tip if you want to, let's back this up just a little bit here. If you want to tell the jury that these two guns are completely indistinguishable from each other and so forth, um, maybe buy a Denix and a Pieta that are the same finish. Because the jury's sitting here going, oh, well, uh, the Pieta is clearly darker than the other, and so it's obvious. Anybody can tell these two apart. Um Although the jury might be having trouble seeing them with when they're like backlit by that tie. Uh, you can't coach a witness, but you can like you can prep them, and this guy has not been prepped, or at least no, I suspect this guy was prepped. I think he's going off like I think he's just yeah. He's here to tell everyone how smart he is. I couldn't use the term expert; it didn't fit. I'm just going to say, you're going to encounter guys like this at every gun range who are just like, you know, the 1911 was the finest gun ever made. And it's like, yes. Yeah. Now, you know what the jury is mentally doing right now? They're mentally comparing this guy to Mr. Haig, who we saw earlier. And they're going, which gun expert do I think is the experty expert? And um, who thinks it's this guy? Um, chat, give me a one if you think this guy is the guy that the jury's going to like better. Or a two if you think that Haig is going to be the guy the jury thinks is the better expert. Um, this is like the fuddiest fud. Yeah. Mr. Kiske, in your view as an expert in this case, are you aware? I haven't seen whether a single one yet. There is a there was a Denix revolver like that on set on Rust. Yes, there is. It was covered in the in, in the invoices as rented by Rust Management. Now, not demonstrating at this point, but you can you tell the jury based it's on just what you just showed them on the piano how you safely oh do there's a one that firearm when you get uh, it cocked. You wish me to pick up the gun and show how it is decocked. I would prefer first showing on a Denex to them yes. and then on a line. Just show, don't. I'm going to object. This guy is not actually responding to questions. Like, this guy is just on his own thing. I suspect that's what that objection is. Is like, this guy's not responding to questions. He's just, like, yammering. Amy Klis or Kislik, thank you so much. Or Kislik, I'm not sure how to pronounce that properly. Uh, the world wonders, if there's anyone with native ancestry on the jury, likely in New Mexico, they're going to have feelings about the Custer bit. Yeah, there was a reason why I was saying, like, what color uniform does this guy wear in his reenactments? Because um, that might be an interesting question. I, I just, I wonder. His name is literally Mr. Tuski. <laughs> I think it's Kuski, but I'm not sure. All right, let's cover some super chats while we can. At least the hammer matches his tie. <laughs> this guy missed the mark so bad. Yeah. You're handling this a lot better than EDB. She was stunned. I mean, I'm stunned too. I'm just like, what the... F if I was a uh, juror in management, he might have lost me. Um the armor's management, actors of the workers. This is a little behind. The FBI lab guys were more exciting than this. Uh, Department of Transport has random drug testing, alcohol restrictions, sleep work hour restrictions. Armor has eh, whatevs. Uh, how big is the local police department where this occurred? Pretty small. Uh, Gray Hat Jen, uh, thank you so much for the YouTube membership. Uh, 
Fat Yoga, thank you for the five gifted okay, memberships. Mr. Kuski, if you will, uh, looking using forward to the Venom's upcoming rant. Replica, demonstrate that the, the cocking and proper decocking of that weapon. Yes. This is one of the primary things that an individual must be trained in to safely cock and decock a Colt revolver or a replica. Now, first, the finger has to stay off of the trigger and outside of the trigger guard, no matter what. That's the essential rule of safety. The firearm is cocked with your thumb, you see. Finger's still outside of the trigger. No one touches any trigger. This is now <laughs> a gun capable of being fired. Now, the first thing I do here is put my thumb on top of it. If I'm not real strong, I put two thumbs on. Notice my finger is still completely off the trigger. I then slowly, gently pull the trigger and lower the hammer onto the cartridge. I then back it up to its safe position. Now I will... By the way, that's not correct. <laughs> um, you can actually lower it directly onto the safe position without the intervening thing of putting the hammer on the cartridge. Um, you don't need to go all the way onto the cartridge. You can put it directly into the safe. <laughs> Remember how there's that quarter notch. You could put it directly to the quarter notch in decocking it. If you want to, um, <laughs> sir, you are wrong. <laughs> like they bring out this like antique from Custer's era and he doesn't even get it wrong or it doesn't even get it right demonstrate the same thing exactly and then he just flags the the crowd again he just he just flags the audience again with a real theater revolver okay we have theater safely aimed my finger is off the trigger you can see this is where it has to stay um if those are my choices i'm not making the movie like, I, the movie is going to be about, like, a guy who takes the bus with no guns. Um. Fingers in there, you can't decock safely. Now, again, we talk one, two, three, four. CAO so it's full, fully cocked. This is a cocked, ready-to-fire revolver if it were loaded. My finger must stay off the, out of the trigger guard and on the side. Now, I put my finger in, but I don't put it in until I put my thumb here. Even putting it in before, like that, would cause it to fire, perhaps. You see what he just told the jury? Let's watch that again. You see what he just told the jury? Watch this. Here, Even putting it in before. Whoop. Like we didn't go back far enough. On the side. Now, I put my finger in, but I don't put it in. Watch this again. On the side. Now, I put my finger in, but I don't put it in until I put my thumb here. E I put my finger in, but I don't do that until I put my thumb here. Um, like, dude, the thumb goes first, and then you put your finger, like, I don't trust this guy with this gun in this courtroom. I do not trust this, like... If I'm the judge, I'm going, uh, Bailiff, can you just take the gun away from him? He does not get to do this demo in my courtroom. Um, like, and I know we just had this, like, confirmed as unloaded, but still, when you can't get through your demo of how to do the, the gun safety, like, how, without making a critical error... I would have laughed so hard, so hard, if he goes, you put your finger in and it just went click. It would have been like, um, yeah. I've <sighs> been putting it in before, like that would cause it to fire, perhaps. Now, I'm holding the hammer back. I can feel the spring. So we just told the jury I screwed up and this could have gone off, and whoops. Everything's safe. Now my finger goes on the trigger pulls the trigger, slowly lowers to a safe position without snapping, and then pulls back to the safety notch, which removes the firing pin from the... 
You can go directly to the safety notch, my dude. I've done it. I would show you guys doing this, except YouTube does not allow me to do that with a gun on a live stream. And I wouldn't want to do it because this guy makes me drink and I don't handle guns when I've been drinking. So, <laughs> Megan Brogdon, I wouldn't trust him with a nerd gun. I assume that's a Nerf gun, but yes. Um, oh my God. Cartridge. Notice my finger's out of there again, not that the gun is cocked. And that's the only decocking. A guy doing this experience can do it with his thumb because this is all knurled here so it can't slip. Fingers out of there. I decock safely. Okay. okay. Th thank you, sir. Now, did you catch which direction he just spun it in as he was putting it down? I decock safely. We're just going to take this right down to half speed. Okay, thank, thank you, sir. Spins it at the jury again. <laughs> this guy just can't help himself, like, pointing the gun at the jury. Like, oh, my God. Um, defense attorney should just dismiss the witness. It, looks, it would look very bad, but not as bad as letting him continue. I honestly... Um, I would have just said no questions for this witness once he pointed it at the, the judge in front of the jury. Um, it might look bad to just send your expert home, but... And I'm also just going to say, at this point, now that everyone's seen this guy, if you call this guy as an expert, um, you should check that your malpractice insurance is up to date. Because um, <laughs> this guy is... a. Uh, an absolute this guy's not just a clown he's the whole circus thank you for de demonstrating that and i wanted to ask you with your <laughs> thank you for demonstrating that and flagging the jury and making multiple safety errors as you do with regard to that operation um in in this particular case we're dealing with a movie set obviously yes um do the general rules of firearm safety including the demonstration you just did do they apply at equal... I'm sorry, the general rules of firearm safety do not apply to the demonstration he just did because that is not where we are. ...on movie sets. Absolutely. And Zora's got some opinions okay. in the background. Now, in your uh, work as an expert in this case, reviewing all the information, did you agree with Mr. Haig's conclusion regarding uh, violation of some of those safety rules? Absolutely. Now, I want to ask you, um, I want to switch <laughs> topics. I want to ask you about uh, reloading. There's been some testimony about an inertia puller. Yes. And if you could tell the jury um, what an inertia puller is. An inertia puller is basically a type of hammer that pulls bullets out of loaded cartridges uh, when you have a misfire or you wish to disassemble old ammo. Basically, it has a plastic head about this big. It has a, hammer, a handle on it like a hammer. It costs about 12 bucks. You put the cartridge, which could be any kind of cartridge, old dead cartridges, whatever you got, and you put it in, clamp it down with a little device, close the thing up. Sir, nobody wants to see your finger in the hand gesture. Like, <laughs> all right. There'll be an empty space underneath, and there'll be a ring here um, holding the cartridge. We're not handle, exactly and certain. And you bang it on a table, and the bullet is pulled out. That The bullet, remember, is the lead part, not the case. And the bullet will fall out. If there's powder, that will fall out as well. You then get a bullet, a ching. You have powder, which you can pour out. And you have a case, which may or may not be live primed or you know, maybe a good primer, maybe a rechargeable case, maybe anything. So, um, I saw Emily was going like, wait, is this really what it is? It, yeah, it's just a hammer. Um, it's like just a hammer with a little bit of a, you know, with a little compartment for it. You just, you literally just smack it on a table. The way it works is that you get the bullet moving when you swing the hammer and then stopping suddenly and it holds on to the, the casing so, um, I'm going to pull up my dummy here. Um, so, um, you got this thing, you put it sort of in the, the hammer and then you swing it. And basically it gets this thing moving at speed and it stops holding the case. And then the bullet gets 
pulled by inertia because the bullet is moving and the case stops and so the bullet gets yanked downwards. That's how an inertia puller works. So um, it, it's real simple, right? It's real. But yeah, he, he makes noises. He, yeah. Um. Okay, so Mr. Kuski, if you wanted to reload a round, let's say you want to convert a dummy round to a live round, what are the steps in the reloading process? Now he goes through this for like 60 minutes and he makes it way too complicated. And I'm just like, why? Nobody's actually alleged that she made a dummy round into a live round. Nobody's actually, like, so I don't know why she goes through that. Like, why do they go through all of this um, at all? I just don't understand where they're going with this. Because they're like, how, what would the steps be in order to do this? And I go... Um, who cares? He goes through this for like 20 minutes and, um, I, I don't get it. So, um, yeah, we can, we'll skip ahead a little bit because, um, nobody needs to hear this. It has no, um, no relevance as far as I can tell. And now we're in a, uh. Mr. Kuski, um, do you regularly, um, as a gun collector, gun owner, everything, do you regularly um, have interaction with different types of ammunition? Yes, I do. And does it, that include live ammunition and dummy ammunition? Yes, it does. And do you, um, with regard to the dummy ammunition, um, do you teach individuals safe, proper gun safety? Absolutely. I'm an NRA certified pistol instructor. Um, NRA, uh, this is why your reputation is not so great. And also cancel his certification, cancel his certification because he couldn't handle a gun in this courtroom without any, without trouble. Cancel his certification now. Um, Oh, my God. And as part of that, do you sometimes use dummy rounds uh, in your teaching with them? Yes, I do. In that capacity, have you become familiar with various types of dummy ammunition? Yes, I do. I and are am. you familiar with various types of live ammunition? Yes, I am. Do you store live ammunition, um, or do you have a place to store live ammunition yourself? Yes, I do. And do you have a place to store dummy ammunition yourself? Yes, I do. Are you familiar with whether there are any dangers of storing those uh, together? Absolutely. All right, so this is going to get dumb. Also, um, I can walk you through the easiest way to turn one of these dummies. Like, if I have a dummy, what is the easiest way for me to go from having a dummy to having a live cartridge, right? So I've got a dummy right now. I want to to get a live cartridge as quickly and easily as possible. Um, I go and buy one. <laughs> like, it's way easier to just go buy a live cartridge than to go through all of the steps to, like, or in this case, I'd just go into the other room, open my safe up, and pull out a live cartridge. Like, and And, and why would that be? There are two sides of the danger, one easy to see, and that is if a live round somehow found its way in with look-alike dummy ammunition, you would have a very severe chance of having somebody getting killed. Now the like, say, happened with Ms. Hutchins. Um, mm, whose job is it to prevent live rounds from ending up mixed with the dummies whose job is that um i forget is oh it's that young lovely young woman who's sitting next to you defense counsel <laughs> flip side is perhaps equally dangerous though less visible if i'm hunting russian wild boar which i hunt with a handgun in california and i sir nobody cares what the We've gotten to the 30 to 50 wild boar moment of this. Like, uh, 
go to shoot at a Russian wild boar that weighs 325 pounds and it's coming right at me and the gun goes click because I substituted a dummy, I will be the dead one. So yes, both sides are bad. Absolutely. Sir, if you're this shitty of a hunter that a single, like, defective round is going to cause you to die, um, like, I can tell you, I have gone bear hunting. And when I'm hunting a bear, there is a possibility that any cartridge I may um, may use might be a, a bad cartridge. It happens, right? And so it might be that you line up and you take the shot and it just goes click. You cycle the action and you fire another one. With a revolver, it's real easy. What happens if one, you know, if you pull the trigger on a revolver and it goes click well you pull the trigger again and it hopefully goes bang um yeah um, and with regard to your storage of ammunition um, is it important to have an inventory system yes i have a inventory system uh, for all my ammunition all my powder all of my reloading uh, which goes into dozens of different kinds of rounds. And, and in the course of your reloading, did you become aware that in, in 2021 time frame, was it difficult to purchase primers? Yes, uh, we called the great ammo shortage, and there was, for a variety of reasons, a huge run on ammunition. You couldn't get primers to reload. You know, they, they just didn't happen. You couldn't get them. You go to the store, you couldn't get them. <laughs> you couldn't get even 9 millimeter ammo. You couldn't get almost anything. The store shelves were emptied out. People were hoarding powder. Even my long range rifle stuff, I couldn't get powder. So yes. So uh, bear hunting is for, I mean, I don't really see how I'm using every part of it. And it's, I also hunt rabbits. Like the whole point of hunting isn't that you're in danger. You shouldn't be in danger when you're hunting unless you're doing it wrong. So this whole thing of like hunting is not about like a fair fight. Um, I also go fishing. The fish isn't going to take me out. To a certain extent, it still goes on. Now, during your course as an expert, this, in this case, you heard Mr. Haig's testimony. Do you agree with his conclusion that the live rounds found on set were uh, reloads? Yeah, well, hand loads. Hand a reload loads. means that it's an old case reloaded. He was very... She's just tired of this. I'd rather go hunting with Cheney. Yep. Um, Light Queen. Huh. Alec Baldwin in the uh, church with the pistol. That part of the game was solved. Move on. Yep. Thank you, Patty P., for the member chat. Uh, Wendy Wilkinson. Didn't Hannah Gutierrez not want to disclose source of the ammo for the plea deal? Hence why we're watching her on trial. Correct. Um, she was offered a plea deal if she revealed who brought the ammo. Jeff Labeats. She unloaded both barrels. Uh, Squinting Cat, thank you for the $20. That's actually probably why we won't see her testify, because then she could be asked where that came from. And, um, yeah. Uh, a defense attorney cross-examining a former cop that seems dishonest. She's at home here. Yep. Uh, Mark E., I th uh, thought what that guy laid out was the investigation was sloppy. Nothing the prosecution asked changed my mind. Fair enough. Mr. Kuski, uh, is it your opinion that the, from your viewing them, that the live rounds on set were reloads or hand loads yes it is and would you explain what the uh, what you saw the the quality the uh, were they lower quality in your opinion lower quality than what uh, in terms of uh, like a uh, store-bought round from a major manufacturer or something like that or or do you have an opinion on that well i i believe they were less consistent than that uh, of uh, a major manufacturer. Need it, and I, I can expand on that if you wish. Yes. Okay. When you get... I'm, I'm going to object again uh, to Liz's approach. So, and somebody's saying, what's he wearing behind his tie? I think it's a holster. And, yeah. Um, I think it's a holster. So... 
Yeah, this is um, <laughs> this is getting a little ridiculous. Uh, Volpez uh, Incolta, thank you so much. Uh, Runkle, could he be trying to show how to turn a dummy into a live to show sabotage? Someone gains access to where the dummies are kept and converts to other pro... The problem is, is if they're trying to show a sabotage theory here, his explanation was like 20 minutes, right? And his explanation took forever. So if it's like all these steps, then it's like, well, nobody sabotaged it. It has to be Hannah's fault. Um, so I don't, I don't get it. Um, I don't, I don't get it at all. Um, yeah, I wish we could hear the objections too. Um, we just, we can't. Um, April Lovelace, thank you for the five gifted memberships. Let's go through some more, uh, super chats here while they're, uh, doing their thing. Um, Roro, my husband has three dozen firearms and six foot tall safes. He's losing his freaking mind right now. He never watches Law, Law Tube, but he is today. Holy F. I, I know the witnesses today. It's just like, yeah. Prosecution should have mentioned the inertia puller more. I bet we see this mentioned in uh, closing. Um, I, If I was the prosecution, I would have been writing that issue. Carding to Hall, she did hand the gun to Baldwin. There's disputes on that. Ariana Murphy, this is the most satisfying part of this whole trial so far. I have a very warm feeling in my heart right now watching the investigator get savaged. States Exhibit 63 and 69 are not the same box. Look at the uh, JS. It looks like she's saying they are the exact same box. Fair enough. This crosses okay, a Perry Mason moment. So your opinion yep. is that these are hand loads? Correct. Okay. Now, do you understand also as an expert in reviewing the information in this case, there are a variety of different types of dummy rounds on set? I have some sco there soothing were, scotch a, a with variety? me. variety? Yes. Okay. And did that include rat some that rattled, some that did not rattle, and some with a hole in the side? Yes. Okay. Did you also review evidence in this case of Mr. Baldwin not only being dangerous at the time of the actual tragic shooting, but dangerous at other times on set? Objection. I love how tired she is sounding. Objection. Oh, come on. Yeah. Um, all right. I'm behind, uh, but for me, the investigator testimony was a great example of why the standard is reasonable doubt. Yeah, you can always find something you could do better. Um, Hannah Gutierrez, read request to be in the cops car. No, she effed up. I don't know. Um, Bowles has hired this guy as an expert before. I'm going to cover some of uh, the more recent ones here just because, yep. Uh, you need much bigger pigeons like chickens. Yeah, kind of feeling that. Is this how uh, there was an unexpected misfire earlier on the set? I don't know uh, the proper terminology. She was saying that you load it while you pull the trigger as you're pulling it back. That's a really great way to get a misfire. So that's my theory. What was the intent of this witness? I still okay, don't know. Sir, my, my full question was going to be, did you see evidence that Mr. Baldwin was not safe with firearms after there was a yell of cut in a particular scene and he shot a blank after that scene yes i feel that's unsafe okay so baldwin did something unsafe cool uh one one further question are you familiar with the period weapon called a henry rifle yes i am this is something are you useful. familiar whether if that is loaded or unloaded at the bottom of that rifle whether somebody could see whether there was rounds at the bottom of it, if they're just looking. This is actually a useful thing because the prosecution has been making noise about why did they put dummies in this Henry rifle? Um, why did they, you know, why did that happen? Well, this guy is going to explain that you can in fact see that it, whether it's loaded or not. So it was reasonable for her to put dummies into it. It wasn't a waste of time. It wasn't that she's just playing around with dummies unnecessarily. This is a good question. Um, the problem is, is your witness has blown himself up and you've taken us through this whole random thing. Um, yeah. Yes, a Henry, may I go into yes. detail? A Henry rifle is a predecessor to the Winchester, Mr. Henry actually. Uh, they can be held in contempt and potentially jailed. The Winchester. It was, is a rifle with a very long barrel, doesn't have a handguard under, which was a problem. It's loaded from the top in a kind of a weird way, and the 
ammunition, the cartridges are dropped in into a long tube where a spring pushes them down. One of the biggest disadvantages, and this was in the Civil War, is it has a long open side on it, on the, beneath the barrel, where you can actually look in and see all the loaded cartridges. Now they thought that was a really good deal until they got in the mud of the trenches and the cartridges were all jammed, right? Nobody cares about the history, dude. Just freaking answer the question. Like, I, I just want from my expert an answer to the question could you see the cartridges in the the henry rifle the answer is yes we don't need the history of the henry rifle we don't need like like sir you're here you're here because hannah gutierrez is on trial nobody cares about the civil war like nobody cares about the trenches Oh, but, like, none of this matters. Oh, like, I feel like this is a guy who just has all of this knowledge in his head and nobody ever listens to him about it, right? Nobody ever, um, nobody ever wants to hear this crap because it's freaking dumb. And, like, it, it, I'm a gun guy and I still wouldn't want to listen to this guy. Um... I think people like listen to this when he's in his reenactment class, but nobody else cares normally. Um, but now the jury has to listen to him. So he gets to lecture to them and the jury hates him. Like um, this dude hates gun fuds or makes gun fuds look bad. Jeez. Um, so for the chat who are not gun people, if you are a gun community person, there is a, um, there's a pejorative term, which is FUD. Um, FUD refers to, like, the guys who are, like, you know, it, it's a reference to Elmer FUD. And so a FUD is somebody who's, like, they like tend to like classic guns and be really skeptical of modern guns. Um, they'll tell you at length how some historical gun is, like, the classic gun. Um, they'll, you know, they'll be like, well, you know, uh, well, I, I'm nervous about all the new people shooting. Like, oh, there's a lot of kids shooting today. There's a lot of, like, whatever. Um, eh. This guy is a classic FUD, and nobody wants to... And yes, F-U-D is crypto speak for fear, uncertainty, and doubt. F-U-D-D in the gun community, FUD, just refers to... It's a reference to Elmer FUD. Now, if you look at a Henry, anybody who knows anything about Henry's looks at that Henry and says the whole side's open and you can see ammunition in there, dummies, whatever. And if you don't have that, they're going to be laughing because it looks like an empty rifle. Oh, so, uh, finally, Yeah, I can also say FUDs are really awful for, um, they tend to be a hazard for female shooters. And um, I brought my wife to the gun store at one point and there were like four guys who wanted to walk up and tell her everything about like some historical gun or, and I'm like, she doesn't give a shit. First, she's with me. Second, she doesn't give a shit. She like, she's not a big thing. So yeah. And they say same effect for the Henry can be done with a plug. Only indication of rounds in the tube magazine is the sliding handle on the bottom of the tube. I mean, really, ideally, they should show the jury on this. Um, yeah. yeah. The Forgotten Weapons guy is interesting. This guy is not. That's that's kind of the problem. Sir, the last question I want to ask you, with regard to... Oh, thank God, it's the last question. The trial, one point of Miss Gutierrez Reed holding a shotgun with it pointed uh, in front of her. And is there... Uh, do you have an opinion on that with regard to, for example, military drill? Yes, I do. She does, she's not big on guns. Let's see this question again. Now with regard to, oh, sir, uh, finally, sir, the last question I want to ask you, with regard to, uh, there were oh, some cases in the trial, one point of Miss Gutierrez Reed holding a shotgun with it pointed uh, in front of her, and is there, uh, do you have an opinion on that with regard to, for example, military drill? Yes, I do. I 
objection relevance. There's no indication that there was a military drill going on. Like, Hannah was not doing a military reenactment. She was wandering around with a gun casually. So, like, who the F cares? Yeah, try being a female shooter in a wheelchair. Fuds come out of the woodwork. Yeah. Oh. They're not doing military drill. I'm convinced she's practiced her glasses handling. There were times she's used them for emphasis. I think it's just a habit, but um, this guy... I think she's practiced her glasses handling more than this guy's practiced courtroom uh, gun safety. Can a person become so comfortable with guns that the comfort becomes carelessness? Yes, there's actually... Uh, uh, this is a known uh, thing. Yet another objection. Withdraw that question. And I Sir... Don't get snippy with the prosecution. Yet another objection. I'm going to withdraw that question. You asked a stupid question. Y you you asked a stupid question, and it got properly objected to. Don't snipe at the jury. <laughs> I don't know if I can listen to this BS again. Thankfully, we're almost done. Like, we're almost done. It's going to be a shorter one today, which is good. That's all the questions I have. You just, like, the way to do that that doesn't make you seem like a whiner is you just say, um, after the objection, you just come back and you say, no more questions. Or, sir, thank you for your time. Um, no more questions. Like, done. And now we get, and somebody's saying, is EDB in the chat? She is. Uh, now we get to see the cross-examination. And this guy is, um, Possibly. yeah. <laughs> I love this so much. I love this so much. Um, listen, listen. <laughs> A long sigh. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> that big... I feel like this guy gets that a lot. I feel like this guy gets that a lot with just the... <sighs> okay. I feel like I need to clip that and just use that for things. Uh, Mr. Kuski. Do you agree with me that basic gun safety requires that the handler of the gun not point the gun at anyone? If it's a real gun, yes. <laughs> he already knows where she's going. He already knows where she's going. He's like, it wasn't a real gun. It wasn't a real gun. It was a fake gun. I can point it where I want. Do you agree with me? that while you were sitting here in the courtroom, uh, you pulled out a gun and you pointed it at the judge? I do not. You disagree? I pointed the gun into this space up here, never directly at the judge. Do you agree? I'm just going to say, um, if this is the subject of cross-examination where you're arguing whether or not you pointed a gun at the judge in trial, you are done. <laughs> Like, um, you know, it's one thing for like an accused person to be asking, answering questions about whether they pointed a gun at somebody. Like, did you point a gun at the judge? Is like, this should not be a cross examination. Uh, let's just let's Do watch you bulls. Agree with me? that while you were sitting here in the courtroom, uh, you pulled out a gun and you pointed it at the judge? I do not. You disagree? I <laughs> His pointed face. the gun into this space up here, never directly at the judge. Do you agree that basic gun safety requires that you uh, keep the muzzle of the gun pointed down for safety? Not at all. A gun may be pointed as any hunter education class like I taught. May be pointed up, may be pointed back, may be pointed cross arms. 
as in the military, may be pointed at the ground, may be put in something uh, like a military stance, at, such as order arms with the butt on the ground and the piece right under your arm. So, no. And to further, in a cross draw or any no, of the... No, no, I'm not talking about a cross draw. Thank you. She's just like, sir, we're not, we're not getting into another one of your explanations. You know, so then I tied an onion to my belt, as was the fashion at the time. Like, that's where he wants to be. He wants to be talking about how smart he is. And she's just like, sir, we're not getting into you talking about how smart you are. We're talking about how dumb you are. Um, do you agree that when you uh, pulled that firearm out and pointed it in the direction of the judge, the deputy standing next to you, had to intervene and grab the gun yeah, and point object. it down. I'm I'm guessing I know what the objection is. The objection is is that he didn't technically point a firearm at the judge. He's already denied that, and in fact, the thing he pointed at the judge was the Denix replica. But the jury's already heard. You pointed the gun at the judge, and the bailiff had to push it down. She's going to move on after this, and, yeah. Like, you're done as a witness when when the question is, did you point, like, Mr. Expert on gun safety, did you point a gun at the judge or not? Um, yeah. Uh, please like and check out Roll of Law's channel. Thank you so much. Um, Scorpion, a deal? She knows where it came from. Dad, I mean, if it came from Seth Kenny and she could testify to that under oath, wouldn't she say that? Now, what does he say? He just said it was a replica. He just chimed in. He speaks up during, sir, you are not a lawyer. You do not get to intercede in the sidebar at your own freaking trial. What he says, and I, I can read lips a bit. He says, it was a replica gun. Watch his lips again. You can see it. It was a replica gun. That's what he says. Wait for it. It, wa it was a replica gun. You can see it. Replica gun. You do not get to... <laughs> you are not part of the sidebar, sir. This is... <sighs> I'm I, I've adopted Emily's sir. Um, watching watching a lot of Emily has gotten the sir in my head. You are not a lawyer. You do not. Oh, <laughs> you are not part of this. This does not involve you. <laughs> and you should never be in a place where you're having to tell the jury. I, I wasn't po act po I wasn't pointing a real gun at you. Oh my goodness! Yeah, somebody says goat. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, if Alec Baldwin did unsafe things with guns, it's management responsibility, like a role specifically tasked with supervising guns, like an armor. Yep. Uh, your 10-minute rants about history are the same thing the witness is doing. Let it go. Sorry. Mr. Kuski, um, have, have you ever been uh, qualified as an expert in firearm safety in a court of law? No. Have you ever worked on uh, criminal cases before? Yes, I have. Have all of the cases that you've, the criminal cases that you've worked on, has Mr. Bowles been the uh, attorney in all of them? Not at all. This one is a misfire by the prosecution. This is, um, they got an answer from this guy on a, pr in their, um, you know, in their pretrial interviews and they, they either didn't understand it or, or he's wrong, but, um, yeah. Not at all? No. She's like, okay, I'm, I'm going back to get my, <laughs> I, I, She's, this is a misfire, but it is still funny because she's like, okay, let me get the receipts. <laughs> let me get the receipts. Give me a moment, please. 
What about military drills? They twirl the rifles around. Usually they're using like replicas for that, um, but yeah. That said, you shouldn't do that in most circumstances. At this trial, they should have drinks and sidebar. They should make sidebar an actual bar. <laughs> she's finding it, and she's like... Let me clarify my question. Have you worked on criminal cases related to the securities industry? Yes, I have. Okay. Other than, and, and you're an investment banker, correct? Not exactly, but sufficient name for it. Okay. Um, and other than working on uh, criminal cases having to do with securities, do you agree with me that the, the only other types of criminal cases uh, you've worked on have all involved Mr. Bowles? I do not. Uh, isn't it true, sir, that... Uh, you you provided a pre-trial interview in this case on November 29th, 2023. Yes, yes. At least this guy recognizes that he did provide a pre-trial interview. Um, yeah. And isn't it true that during that interview, my investigator, Mr. Rice, asked you, is Mr. This is how you do it when you need an interview of another witness is you use an investigator like Mr. Rice because then you can have Mr. Rice available to like if this guy says, no, that's not what I said. I never said anything like that. Your transcript is complete work of fiction. You can call Mr. Rice as, you know, to like to contradict that. Whereas if the interview is done with Mr. Bowles and, you know, Mr. Bullion, you can't do that because who are you going to call to, you know, not Ghostbusters, um, who are you going to call to contradict him? You know, I'm going to call co-counsel to the stand. No, you're not. Um, the problem is, is she doesn't actually manage to nail him here because he weasels. Mr. Bowles, the only attorney that you've worked uh, with. Role of law. And your response was, outside of the securities industry in the past, yes. Yes, and I have worked since then, and I have worked prior to that confidentially with cases before the United States Navy and other cases which were criminal, and I believed you were speaking only of what's going on here. If you'd like to hear the other ones, I'm very happy to tell you. I worked, for example, with the Monterey Sheriff. Nobody wants to hear the other ones, dude. You just want to... Uh, he just wants to go off. Is there a question? No, there is isn't. There is not a question on the table right now. And the judge is getting tired of it. You Did you hear the judge? Was there a question? And she's like, no, there is no question here. Um... I love this. Bulls didn't know his expert was banned because he doesn't recognize a tool when he sees uh, it. description about how a person could turn a dummy round into a live round. You recall the testimony that you gave moments ago. Yes. Um, I want to talk to you about doing the opposite, okay? I want to talk to you about taking a live round and turning it into a dummy round. Okay. Okay. Uh, do you agree with me, sir, that the first step uh, is you would place the live round in the inertia puller and smack it so that the projectile separates and the powder comes out? Yes. So the reason why she's going with all of this um, is to suggest, this is what she's going to suggest later, I'm sure that we'll see this on her clothes, is that Hannah got live ammo in order to disassemble it to make more dummies because they didn't have enough dummies. Now, here is the problem. Here is the problem. This prosecutor does not know enough about guns to fucking finish this 
and she's going to get it wrong, and it's going to drive me absolutely nuts. Um, but yeah, what she wants to argue is that Hannah was bringing live ammo on set in order to convert it to to dummies because she didn't have enough dummies. And at that point in time, you are left with an empty casing, a projectile, a pile of gunpowder. But the problem with your casing is that it still has a live primer, That's right? That's right. So in order to make the primer inert, you can take that empty shell casing with that live primer, you can put it into a firearm, and you can fire it. Correct. And now I've made the primer inert. There is another way if you wish to hear. No, no, I, I, I appreciate you, though. But you, you... I, I like her thing of, I appreciate you, every time she means shut the F up. Uh, I appreciate you. <laughs> um, I may need to make some I appreciate you merch. Just because when she says, I appreciate you, it means shut your f***ing mouth. <laughs> like, shut your f***ing mouth. Um, so, I'm thinking, like, I appreciate you merch is a good uh, good in-joke there. Um, <laughs> but the thing is, is I would have actually let him... F I, I might not have let him go on his own thing, but she should know the other method here. The other method is you put a solvent or some chemical. Usually you'd use like WD-40 or um, you'd use WD-40 or like gun oil or something else in order to kill the primer, right? It'll do that. It'll get into the primer and it'll ruin it to keep it from go. you know, and... She should have actually let him do that because then you can get to, you know, all of that. But here's the problem is Ballistol. Where did we see a bunch of Ballistol? We saw a bunch of Ballistol on Seth Kenny's desk. So I guess it's risky. I guess that's why she doesn't want to go there. But like gun oil will do it. Um, so. Thank you, you. Yes, I agree. You agree that what I'm saying, it, it can be done. Can be done. And then after I've fired it and I've heard the pop, knowing, knowing that the primer has now been made inert, I can take that projectile and I can just put super glue on it and stick it back into that casing. I'm gonna embiggen so that you can see me do this. Super glue? Are you kidding me? Super glue? No, you don't use super glue. No, you don't use super glue. <laughs> um, so, um, I got some film dummies here, which I keep bringing out because they keep being relevant. Um, there is, I do not, sup these are not super glued in. These are not, and they're not gorilla glued in. They're not. Um, they're not any of that, right? Um, my glass is empty. Where is my scotch? I set my scotch down. Here we go. Um, you, you don't use super glue. These things are just pressed in the cases are a tight fit um you might even say that they are a gorilla grip fit um in order to hold the bullet like that is that is it um and so how do you do that well you use a bullet press and a bullet press is real common Theoretically, you could do it with something other than a bullet press. You could do it with something. But you don't... You don't freaking super glue them. Like, you don't super glue them. Well, you couldn't normally without expanding the case. That's what I was talking about when you do a sizer. You could expand the case with a sizer because what's going to happen... In many cases, and I can't say every one because I've never done super glue, is it's very difficult to get a bullet. He's never, like, this was actually his moment 
Um, this was actually his moment to um, to snark at him or to snark back, which was to say, like, and he misses it. He misses. Oh, crap. I forgot to in Smolin. He misses his moment. He misses his moment. And stick it back into that casing. Well, you couldn't normally without expanding the case. That's what I was talking about when you do a sizer. You could expand the case with a sizer because what's going to happen in many cases, and I can't say every one because I've never done super glue, is it's very difficult to get a bullet into a case that... Sir, you had a moment. You had a moment to line up and fire. Like, nobody would ever use super glue. You don't, like, super glue... You, this was your chance to, to mock the prosecutor. You earned it. Take the... And the one chance he gets, he just doesn't know. Um, hasn't been expanded in size. You could try it. I can't guarantee it'll work. Sure. I mean, you can take the empty shell casing and you can put it on top of a projectile and you can take your inertia puller or a hammer yeah. and just tap it and down. Inertia uh, an inertia puller is made out of plastic. It is not for tapping anything down. But you could take... He's he's sitting there like, you are saying some stupid things, but he doesn't know how to actually deliver on that she's saying some dumb things here. Um, a hammer, but what's very likely to happen is you'll bend the case beyond all use and recognition and it can't fall in. That's why you expand cases in the process. You could try it. I've never beaten any... Bullets. Some bullets are very, very hard. Some are soft. So it is. Dude, stop! Like you, you are hired by the defense. This is the point where you just say no. What you are saying is stupid. You need the following tools in order to do that. Like, this is your. But he, the problem is, is he wants to show how smart he is and how he could maybe do it. What he should say is, no, in order to do that, you would want to, to, you know, properly size the case. You'd want to press the bullet in with a bullet press. You'd want to crimp it. Like, mm, oh my God, I hate this guy so much. <laughs> He's bad at everything. He's bad at everything. He's given an opportunity. And the problem is this is an expert who's not here for Hannah. This is an expert who is here so that everyone can hear him talk. And I, I oh my God, I hate this guy. Um, I would never call this guy as an expert. I hate him so much. It's possible with a soft lead bullet that you could maybe not bend your case and maybe not shave off your bullet. Possible. And the thing is, is this is a dumb way to do it. You could say it's a dumb way to do it. The prosecution is actually saying something dumb, sir. Just tell them that. Like, Hannah is sitting there. She's watching you. She's desperate for you to say, that is stupid. Help the woman who's paying your freaking bills, dude. <laughs> like, oh my god. This is the thing that's frustrating, is at every point, there's, like, these moments that the defense could really nail things. And I think the defense could be sitting in a position where they're just looking at an easy acquittal. And they get this crap. No. And isn't it true, sir, that the live ammunition found on the set of rust, in fact, had soft lead bullets? I didn't measure the lead, so there's there's something called a. Well, hang on. I appreciate your response. Um, in I appreciate response. <laughs> in fact, sir, y you have never actually viewed the live rounds that are in evidence. You've only seen pictures of them. Isn't correct. that correct? So you haven't taken them and looked at them, right? right? I've taken all the pictures and looked, that's it. Okay, uh, but but you watched the testimony of our expert, Mr. Haig. Yes, I did. And isn't it true that Mr. Haig testified that the projectiles from the live rounds found on the set of rust were soft lead? I didn't hear soft, but lead, certainly. They weren't copper jacketed, no, correct? No, not copper jacketed. And he also testified that because they were lead and lead is a soft metal, that's the reason that that projectile became so damaged when it went through Ms. Hutchins and into Mr. Souza. And this is the thing she could say, like, you know, or he could 
say, listen, lead come like there's different. Um, you know, lead could be alloyed with something. There's all sorts of possibilities. Like if it's pure lead, then it's going to be, you know, really solid. But, you know, like, but he just misses this. And instead he comes off weaselly. He comes off like, hey, I, I don't know. And it's like, well, just answer Absolutely. the question. It's called ballooning. All right. Thank you, sir. And he's got to tell us what it's called. Um, you testified on direct examination that you can't tell a live round. She's allowed to lead on cross. Uh, in a photograph. Simply in a photograph. I agree with Mr. Haig who said the same thing. Well, do you agree with me that you can tell a live round from a dummy round in a photograph if that dummy round has a hole drilled into the casing so it can't have any gunpowder? Absolutely. All right. Thank you, sir. Bowles is not feeling great about this right now. And in your review of the case materials, sir, you, you understand uh, that live ammunition from PDQ props was sent to the, F to the FBI and it was determined to be substantially different than the live rounds found on the set of rust. I do. Uh, you gave an opinion earlier that you believe that the live rounds were hand loads. Yes, you recall I do. that? Yes. And I just want to be clear, you're giving that opinion just from looking at photographs, not from going to the evidence room, taking the evidence, handling it in the way that Mr. Haig did. Yes, and, right. and from Mr. Haig's testimony as well. Okay. I'll pass the witness. And now Bowles is going to try to no, save this guy. Nope. No, he isn't. This witness is excused. Thank you. Um, when you get... When you get smashed like that on cross and the lawyer is just like, I, I don't have anything to, to do. Um, yeah. This is a trial where they have, like, I don't love a redirect. I usually, if my witness does badly on, on cross, it's just like, okay, it's not going to fix anything. But this trial, they've redirected on, like, every witness. And this guy, he's just like, no. Pfft, no. So, um... This is the last witness we get today. And what else do they tell us? Well, and I'm going to just move this down. Um, what else they tell us is we are going to get close arguments tomorrow. I They had said initially that we were getting closing arguments on the 7th. But instead, we're getting closing arguments tomorrow, a whole day early. Um, which is wonderful for me because I'm going to be flying on the 7th. Uh, so I won't be able to do a recap on the 7th. Um, fantastic timing for me. But I'm just wondering, like, why are we this far ahead of things? Um, so I'm excited. We're going to get to see the closing arguments. I am super psyched by that. Um, we'll just have to see what, you know, what happens. They've said they're calling, uh, they said they are calling more witnesses. And so, um, I don't know who that'll be. It won't, I am pretty sure it won't be Hannah for two reasons. One, if it was going to be Hannah, they would need a whole day for Hannah, right? They'd need a whole day for Hannah. And I see people saying there's Wi-Fi on the planes. I'm going to be flying like Air Canada and Air Canada does not typically have Wi-Fi on the planes because the plane is... As old as this guy. Um, so, um, I think we're going to see Thel. Yeah, I think Hannah decided not to testify. Um, she Hannah would have been the whole day, right? At least the whole day. Because you got a plan that she's going to get just, like, the cross exam of her is going to be long. Even if you just put up Hannah up on the stand and said no questions, um... She's going to be crossed forever. Um, the other thing is that Hannah really doesn't want... Um, she got an offer for a deal, and she turned it down in part because she didn't want to say where the bullets might have come from. And so I don't think she wants to get up on the stand, because if she gets up on the stand, she's got to... Like, she'll have to answer that question. Where did the bullets come from? Under oath. So if that wasn't if that was something she was unwilling to do to make a deal, 
I don't think she's going to do it. So we do get Hannah's words in this through her interviews. And her words in her interviews are bad. So what I think we're going to see is probably Thel Reed. Yeah. Um, I also think they'll end with Thel. Thel is going to put the responsibility on production and on Seth Kenny. Thel and Seth Kenny used to be really good friends to the point that Thel would stay with Seth Kenny when they were in town. Um, Thel and Seth Kenny are no longer good friends. Thel and Seth Kenny, um, like, Thel hates him now. Um, Thel is also really old and really past his prime. So, and the other thing is that if I'm the prosecution, I'm going to suggest all sorts of things to Thel, like, hey, you were the source of the live rounds. You screwed this up. You're the reason your daughter is here. You didn't teach her right. You didn't anything. You suck. So, yeah. Um, that'll be a fun conversation, right? Um, and, yeah. Um, I'm really excited to see it. I'm, I'm going to be watching. I'm going to be listening to commentary on various channels. Um, you know, I'm usually... So, uh, Thel stayed in the hoarder prop house. Yeah, apparently. I don't know if it was that place or somewhere else. Because that prop house, I think, was just... Um, um, I think that was just storage. But um, I really want to see Thel on cross-examination. Because Thel is apparently an ornery guy. And um, and so is Carrie. She's ornery, too. It'll be... Um, it'll be fun. So... Um, that's our day of testimony. We will see this. I'm going to be popping into various chats. Um, I watch, you know, all sorts of places, but um, check out EDB's commentary. Uh, check out Recovery Addict. Check out uh, Legal Bites. Check out all sorts. Um, yeah, and I, I think it's a mistake to have Thel testify. I think it will only go to further hurt the defense case. It may well. Um, we might not see Thel. It might be that they have someone else. I don't know who they've got. Because, um, yeah, let me go through the Super Chats because I am 54 Super Chats deep, so I better do that. Ohio Pom Bomb, her co-workers uh, also had someone stay with her later. Uh, yep, uh, that was referring to, I think, um, uh, what's her name? Um, yeah, James C., more activity from defense team during this cross than any other witness. They're squirting, talking, or squinting, talking to each other, and looking dejected. Defense did not have a good day. They started out really good. I thought that they were... I, They started out the morning, and I thought, like, you guys are nailing this. And... And then they fell apart. They fell apart. It was so awful. Um, went from Mr. Timu investigator to Mr. Timu gun expert. Please give me strength to get through this again. Yeah. Jose B., short explanation. Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1942. <laughs> Your short explanation of your credentials should not start before your birth. Hunter Jillstrap, thank you so much. Uh, Wendy Wilkinson, how to not have your witness qualify themselves as an expert. Oh, my God. Expert on Russian weapons. I just died inside. Yeah. Uh, Fiona W., thank you for the five gifted memberships. Much appreciated. Province of T, the scout should revoke his firearm safety badge. <laughs> yep. Bev's Fry Bread Wisdom, uh, when you're trying to explain gun safety, pointing a gun at the judge does not seem like a good move. Uh, I mean, he's lucky the bailiff didn't go after him because, um, yeah, I, I just... He's lucky. I mean, if the bailiff had drawn on him, nobody would have faulted the bailiff. So uh, instead, the bailiff is just like, sir, down. Like, oh my God. What's the point of this guy? I genuinely forgot. So did the jury, other than to be a guy who pointed the gun at the jury. I just saw the beginning of this guy while catching up on EDB, had the sudden urge to do a wellness check on Runkle. Are you okay? I got a lot of people asking if I was okay today. What on earth is this bozo an expert on legally? I don't know. Uh, he knows diddly squad about gun safety, though. I mean, and I'm in the UK. Yeah. Uh, Nick, ready, set, draw. <laughs> he draws on the judge. Chelsea Rama, this expert is that random guy at a party you can't get out of a conversation with, so you have to pretend you need to relieve the babysitter, even though you don't have kids. 
<laughs> Love that. Steph says, so he brought guns into court, the courthouse and no one checked them. Similarities with what happened on set. Shouldn't he have cable locks? Cable locks probably wouldn't work with that gun. Um, most cable locks are too thick. Um, you can do it with a very thin cable lock. And basically you have to push it through, tilt the cylinder, and then slide it through the barrel. Um, I've done it. It sucks. It has to be a very thin cable lock. A thicker cable lock like most cable locks are will not work in this gun. It's just not a functional thing. So a trigger lock can work. Um, you could remove the cylinder and then cable lock so that you couldn't put the cylinder back. Um, that would work. Um, or just remove the cylinder and be like, yeah, we know it doesn't fire because it's got no cylinder. Um, how is that the best expert they could get? I'm betting he's paid in like, they just have... <laughs> His pay is that they just... <laughs> Hannah and Bowles and Bullion had to sit in a room with him for four hours and listen to his stories. That's how he was paid. Um, so, exile the uh, calm with much love and no fear. Uh, I don't know what that means, but um, okay. Uh, Steph's... Oh, we just read that one. The short explanation should not begin before conception, my dude. I about fell out of bed on that one laughing so hard. I'm just like, oh, did this guy train Hannah? No. Um, Mr. Ray Romantico, this might work for the defense, though, showing how even these firearms experts make these kinds of errors. I think it just looks bad on the defense, like that they brought this guy into the courtroom. Prosecutors thinking about standing behind bulls, except we already know that a forty-five long colt could go through somebody. So, um, even Hannah Gutierrez Reed looks frustrated by this guy. I would be so pissed if I was her, and if, like, she's got to know he's clowning himself, right? So, she's got to know that. Uh, do not put the cable lock down the barrel. Pull the cable lock through the cylinder cage. Yeah. I said you can do it with a very thin cable lock. It's not the way that you want to do it. Um, on a modern pistol, drop the mag and lock the slide back, then feed the cable through the chambered mag well. That's what a cable lock is for. Um, is for going through the mag well. Um, so. Would my uh, diving to the floor have caused a mistrial either in the gallery or the jury? I don't think so. Um. He's uh, here to make Hannah Gutierrez look good by comparison. Yep. Uh, even if it's not real, shouldn't he treat it like it is real, for those who don't know? Yes. He hadn't established which gun was which at this point. So as far as anyone can tell, he's pointing a real gun at the judge. Now, um, yeah. For what it's worth, he's not a Civil War reenactor. The 1st American Regiment was the standing army after the Revolutionary War and mostly fought Native Americans. That's not better. <laughs> um, that's that's not better. I don't I don't like that because if they have anyone on that jury who is a Native American, um, he's going to. Um, that's not going to appeal um, at all. I'm no defense expert, but it's bad to have everyone laughing at your expert, right? Real bad, real bad. After the fantastic armor they had in court the other day, this guy looks like a complete clown. He does. He's ridiculous. Um, my first time feeling sympathy for Hannah Gutierrez Reed and Bulls. Little bit. I, Bullion's sitting there going like, it's a good day to be me. Who tuned in, tuned in to watch Runkle take this witness down? I didn't take this witness down. Kerry took this witness down. The prosecutor took this witness down. Can you get transcripts when they're available? They're expensive. I could get transcripts, but they cost an F ton of money. So maybe, um, I would love to go through and, um, um, I would love to go through and actually get the, um, you know, get the transcripts for the sidebars, but yeah, I just, I don't know. Um, Diane Matire, Matire, uh, thank you so much for the membership. Um, should have Seth manipulate weapons to show the mentoring he gave them. <laughs> I don't think anyone... Yeah. Pigeon business with a goat scream afterwards, please, for, like, extreme, extreme pigeon business, maybe. Opposite of amnesia, this had to be an experiment and immersion with the jury, right? So they can associate having a gun waved around and nothing bad happens. So, melting face. Can a judge disqualify a witness for safety concerns? Particularly the judge asking the gun to be proven safe, then she gets flagged. She can throw a witness out of her court. Like, she can say goodbye. Like, sorry. 
Um, yeah, she she can toss the witness. So, um, uh, dude probably voted for Trump. Um, dude probably voted for I don't know. I this is where I run into trouble not being an American. Um, I'm just trying to look up. I mean, I think this guy voted for Taft. So, <laughs> uh, he's like, I'm, I'm writing in Taft. Uh, Aislinn R. Twice his defense. Crown had guns pointed at me. I took exception to it. They rotated them at the jury, the clerk, the judge, the court reporter, and the gallery. Good grief. Retirement is grand. Um, the, the moment I'm thinking of where I was a defense lawyer and had, um, uh, had, uh, an officer aiming a gun at me and I'm just going to use, I'm using random objects off my desk as gun props. So this is, this is a bottle opener folks. Like it is carved open to be a bottle opener. I got this as like swag at a random gun show. Um, so this is our gun. The officer, every time he was handed a gun, he would sight down the gun at me specifically at me every time. And I could see him sighting at me. And I was like, um, if the witness could stop pointing guns at me and the prosecutor's like, oh, don't worry about it. Like they're, he's check, he's cleared that they're empty. I'm like, I don't care if he's pointing a gun at me. And so the, um, what is it? The judge was like, well, Mr. Runkle, is it really a big deal? And I said, well, it is a crime and I, I will arrest this witness on the stand. And so the judge was like, um, if you could point them some other direction, please, a, a safe direction. And uh, he did knock that off. So, yeah. Uh, I want Rob's opinion on what Judge A would have done. I don't think Judge A would have allowed him to bring the guns into the courtroom at all. Uh, Jeremy Morton, what was uh, this witness intended to accomplish? Did it all get objected to? And this was what was left? No, there wasn't a lot of objections. I mean, well, maybe. All this expert has shown me is how easy it should have been to dismantle the barrel and make checks. Yep. Um, opposite of amnesia, short list of people who would have done better. Afro Man, Jensen Ackles as Dean Winchester, discussing the story arc of the demon killing cult from uh, Supernatural. Yes. <laughs> Criminal Med, how much can we get for a refund on this dude? I, uh, I don't know. Uh, he definitely believes women shouldn't hold guns during periods. Ooh. Uh, what happens if a juror visibly or audibly re reacts to the flag? I absolutely would have. Um, I mean, you could ask that the juror be disqualified. Like, that juror freaked out when my expert pointed a gun at him. But, um, yeah. Um, Caitlin, I've flagged your question. We'll get to it here. Um, do you think her orange blazer is a tactic like Camille's white suit during the Depp Heard trial to keep the jury's attention on her? I think she just likes the blazer. Um, orange blazer so gun experts don't aim guns at her. Maybe. It's like Hunter's Orange so that you don't point a gun at her there. Um, friend dumped a bunch of rounds in olive oil getting back at uh, the husband. Yep, dead primers. Oil will kill the primers and it'll soak into the... Uh, most cartridges are not watertight, by the way. I appreciate you. I thought lawyers can't lie. <laughs> Super duper glue only. <laughs> Thank you, uh, talk, Tall Skinny Geek. Um, Spaceman Spiff. No, no, no. Gorilla Crimp them. Lols. <laughs> Light Queen. I love all, yeah, all Ian's responses to this guy. <laughs> Michael Graziona. Uh, Graziono. Uh, for dummies that need unstruck primers, I use old primers from reloading. Depriming flattens them again. Look fine. Definitely dead. Oh, good thought. Um, yeah, I mean, I, myself, I probably would... Uh, you know, just, I mean, if I was doing film armoring, I would have probably have, you ever been to a barber shop? Um, you know how at the barber shop, they'll have their tools floating in the, um, what do you call it? The blue liquid. Um, what do you call it? Um, what chat help me? Um, what is the stuff they have at, um, Barbicide. There we go. Barbicide. Um, like the disinfectant there. Um, or Barbasol. Um, I would just have like 
gun oil there, like a thing of gun oil to just dump the uh, the primers in. And then it's like, when I need a primer, fish them out. And they've been soaking there for like, um, they've been soaking there for a month. And you're like, pull it out, dry it off. And then I would probably apply a match to it just to be like, if this goes off, then whatever. We know it's dead. Like, you know, just make sure that it is absolutely, um, yeah. Make sure that they're dead, dead, dead. I appreciate you as synonymous for shut the F up. It is. I'm going to have to make some I appreciate you merch tonight. Um, Gigi, thank you for the new membership. Much appreciated. Uh, Tinsilizy, Hannah was in over her head for sure. Thel and Seth definitely prep her for this like they should. But someone died for her incompetence and nepotism. She was not ready for the job. And Bell Feinstein, laughing so hard I almost fell out of my wheelchair twice in one day, dying laughing. My sides are hurting. It was that day. Stacy Hawthorne, what is the Bailey? There is Rumpole of the Bailey is a British um, book and TV series uh, featuring a defense lawyer. So um, my name is a, like my Facebook name is a reference to a um, um, to a very old uh, sort of or not that old, but like a yeah a a defense lawyer that nobody really knows who it is. So I, I picked a very obscure reference to name my channel after it was maybe not the best move. Um, congrats Ian on 26. Wow. 260,000 subscribers. I did not realize we'd binged. I need a bing thing. I need a, um, what do I have for bing? Um, we can use the annoyed bear for bing. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, the old Bailey is a courthouse. Um, it's the courthouse in London. It's the old Bailey. And um, yeah, so there will definitely be I Appreciate You merch coming. <laughs> uh, Hannah wasn't trained right. Uh, witness proves this, in my opinion. Yep. Uh, dude voted for Vermin Supreme. Just Google it for a laugh. He wears a gum boot on his head. Yes. And Caitlin says, Ruckle of the Bailey, I had no idea you have the ability to arrest a witness in court. Is this a privilege that is specific to attorneys in Canada? It's that you actually have the ability to do a citizen's arrest. And I probably wouldn't have done it um, because it would have been risky. But in theory, a citizen can arrest any citizen, lawyer, police officer, anybody can arrest any person uh, that they find committing an indictable offense. And so in this case, finding committing, like finds committing, um, includes this guy directly pointed a gun at me, pointing a firearm, indictable offense. So, um, I can theoretically arrest, theoretically, you can arrest a guy who points a gun at you. Um, you shouldn't do it and especially shouldn't do it to a cop. But it got the judge to actually take it seriously because I was like, I ain't, I ain't messing. Like, we'll, we'll throw down here. So. And yeah, this is a good point. The bailiff would have been within his right to draw on the witness and order him to lower the firearm. Absolutely. The bailiff would have been within his right to hit this witness, to like physically grab him and, you know, whatever else. Hearts Wild, I just found your channel. Are you a lawyer? I am a Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer. So I have been, um, and I do consulting with other lawyers, like other lawyers call me when they have firearm questions here in Canada. Um, I actually just had one call me. Um, he called me like five minutes before I was going to go on stream. And so I was like, um, my dude, I, I can't, I can't call you right now because we're about to be on stream. I loved old Rumpole and she who shall not be named. One day I need to license out a, um, I need to license um, an episode of Rumpole of the Bailey just so I can do a Rumpole of the Bailey review without getting um, uh, like, without getting a copyright strike. So, all right. Um, thank you guys all for joining me. It We're at four hours here. Today was, I thought it was going to be a quick day. I keep thinking I was going to be, it was going to be a quick day, but it was not a quick day. So we're going to wrap this up here. We're going to end this, um, 
end this here. And um, I will see you guys tomorrow. So um, we will, uh, and I'll, I'll get that merch done. You know, I'll get that merch done tonight. So, all right. Uh, see everybody. Where's my outro? I got to find it in these video clips here. Eh, I got too many clips. Uh, outro. There we go. Mm -hmm.